Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 13th and final meeting of 2016. We have apologies from Oliver Mundell. Agenda item number one, decision on taking item in private. Item six and seven are consideration of the committee's um, approach to the security of the Railway Policing Scotland Bill at stage one and consideration of its work programme. Is the committee content to take these items in private? Thank you. Uh, agenda item two, draft uh, budget scrutiny 2017-18. And I welcome to the committee the Right Honourable James Wolfe, QC, Lord Advocate, and David Harvey, Crown Agent and Chief Executive of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. This is the, the first time that, that both of you, or either of you, have appeared before the committee, and we very much look forward to, to working with you um, over this session. I refer members to paper one, which is a note from the clerk, and paper two, which is spice briefing. The Crown agent and, um, has also put in a written submission um, to the current procurator fiscal COPF service inquiry, which is partially relevant to this morning's session. I thank you for, for that. And I believe, Lord Advocate, you'd like to make a short opening statement. Yes, thank you very much, convener. Um, and uh, may I thank you for inviting me to give evidence and also for permitting me to make uh, some preliminary remarks, conscious as I am that this is my first appearance before your committee as Lord Advocate. Um, I look forward very much to working uh, with you during um, this session um, and my period of office. Um, can I say that your inquiry into the work of the prosecution services, from my point of view, timely, uh, and I'm looking forward to coming back, uh, as I understand it, in January to discuss in more detail the evidence that you've received. Um, I understand the purpose of the hearing today is budget scrutiny, and um, uh, as you've indicated, convener, I'm here with the Crown Agent, who is the Chief Executive and Accountable Officer of the uh, service. I'd like to simply make a few observations to set the discussion about the budget in context. Um, the first is this, that the media regularly report on high-profile prosecutions in which, uh, uh, which have been brought to a successful conclusion. Um, those cases which attract public and media attention are only the most visible part of the work of the service which day in and day out across Scotland successfully prosecutes crime and secures the fair and effective administration of the criminal law. Uh, I think it is important that I say that at this, my first uh, appearance before your committee, because uh, I know that some of the evidence that you've received has reflected negatively on the service. Uh, I take seriously the issues that have been raised in the evidence before you. But the starting point for addressing uh, the work of the service should be this, that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is an organisation which day in and day out fulfils its basic fundamental public responsibilities as the prosecutor of crime in Scotland and does so effectively. Uh, the second point I'd like to make uh, at the outset is that uh, this is an organisation which over the past 15 years has shown a remarkable capacity for change. It was at the forefront in Scotland of recognising the needs of victims of crime. It has adjusted rapidly to significant uh, developments in the law and it embraces the potential of technological advance and procedural reform. Um, the service had already identified some of the issues which have been raised in the evidence before you and we will be glad to address specific issues which you wish to raise with us. But what the evidence taken as a whole really demonstrates is the case for reform of the criminal justice system. Uh, you will be aware that we're at an unusual moment where significant reform across the justice system uh, is in prospect. And we would, I believe, fail the people whom we serve if we were not to grasp the opportunities of that moment. Uh, and I'm certainly committed, and I know the Crown Agent is committed, to working with all the agencies involved as we seek to create a justice system which reflects the needs of 21st century Scotland. And finally, if I might make just a brief 
uh, observation about the budget, um, I have to take a realistic view about the pressures on public sector funding. The revenue and capital budgets of the service are the same in cash terms as last year. That is the basis upon which the service has undertaken its forward financial planning. You will no doubt wish in a moment to look in detail at the budget figures, but I would like to make clear to the committee at the outset that the service will continue with this budget allocation to prosecute crime in the year ahead effectively, rigorously and in the public interest. Thank you. Can I remind members that this evidence session is on the 2017-18 Crown Office budget and just to stress again it's not the wider issues raised during our current inquiry. Obviously there will be a slight overlap and I'll allow a little bit um, of latitude on that but in general the session is about um, the budget um, and the Lord Advocate will be attending early in the new year to answer questions about the issue during the inquiry. With that can I open, um, open it to questions from members? Douglas Ross, John Finney. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, um, Mr. Harvey and Lord Advocate. Uh, could I first of all ask the Lord Advocate on your submission through Mr. Harvey, uh, there's a statement made that to protect your constitutional independence, the Lord Advocate deals directly with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. Can I ask, when you go into these meetings, are you the Crown Office's representative in the Scottish Government or the Sc Scottish Government's representative in the Crown Office when you go into those particular discussions? Yes, um, I think the short answer is I am the Lord Advocate. And as Lord Advocate, I am the head of the prosecution system in Scotland. That's a function that I exercise independently, both by statute and for constitutional uh, reasons. Uh, so I go into uh, those discussions uh, uh, as the Lord Advocate um, uh, 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 with my responsibilities as Lord Advocate in my mind. Ah, uh, but you do have you know, dual responsibilities as a member of uh, the government and a member uh, and the head of the Crown Office. So I wonder when you are dealing uh, on financial terms with a, a fellow member of the government, uh, which priority do you lead with? Is it for the Crown Office within the Scottish Government or a Scottish Government member on behalf of the Crown Office? I think it's perhaps artificial to seek to divide up uh, my different functions. I go into um, those discussions, as I go into any discussion, I go into uh, as Lord Advocate, um, as um, the independent head of the system of prosecution in Scotland. So, so I, I have to be, um, a, as the head of uh, uh, any public service in Scotland has to be in the current environment, I have to be realistic about the public financial uh, uh, circumstances that we uh, live in. But my responsibility is to... Um, prosecute crime in Scotland effectively, rigorously, fairly and independently. So, so if you can differentiate with the way I'm, I'm trying to ask that question, would you, which of these two statements would you agree with most? As you come out of that meeting with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, would you agree more with the Scottish Criminal Bar Association who say it's absolutely astonishing that the Scottish Government should cut the Crown Office budget or would you agree with Derek Mackay that it's a sound settlement for the service? I think the first thing to be clear about is that uh, in terms of the revenue and capital budgets, um, the service will receive the same cash funding as it received uh, last year. I'll come on to that and I know that you'll want to look in detail at that uh, proposition, and I understand that. Um, uh, but those are two quite stark um, um, responses from different sides. The Scottish Government ministers are saying it's a sound settlement for your service, yet the Scottish Criminal Bar Association says it's absolutely astonishing that there should be cuts to the budget. So which one would you think is more accurate? It's a settlement which um, uh, is consistent with the um, forward financial planning of the service. It's a settlement within which I'm confident that we will continue to prosecute crime effectively in Scotland in the coming year. Um, uh, it's a settlement which um, uh, I'm advised is consistent with the settlement for um, uh, other justice uh, agencies, um, um, uh, broadly speaking. So, I'm, I'm, I'm so, 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 so from that point of view, it's a settlement which uh, enables me uh, in the 
forthcoming financial year to fulfil my public responsibilities. So, just because I'd like clarity on this, because there is some confusion, do you agree with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance that it's a sound settlement for the service, or do you agree with the Criminal Bar Association for Scotland, which says it's absolutely astonishing that there should be cuts to the COPFS budget? Well, it's, it's, it's a sound uh, settlement for the service on the basis I've just described to you. Um, for the reason I mentioned a moment ago, um, I, I think to describe it as a, as a cut in the way that um, uh, uh, Mr. Ross articulated it is, is, is not, a, 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 not the full picture. Is there a real terms redu reduction in your budget? Uh, there is a real terms reduction um, because... Um, and you think that's a sound settlement? Be, be, because uh, we have um, secured um, uh, in revenue and capital terms the same uh, cash uh, as uh, last year. Um, there is an important point which I know you'll want to discuss and it may be that the Crown Agent will be better placed than I am to discuss the detail of it, but um, 1.4 million um, or an apparent reduction of 1.4 million um, is, uh, as I understand it, a change in, in, in the allowance made for depreciation. It doesn't affect the cash that's available for the um, uh, running of the service. I, I will come on to that if I can, but if we take a look at your level three funding, do you have that? Um, do we have that? Well, well, for example, uh, staff costs in 2016-17 uh, were 73.4 million. In 2017-18, they'll be 72.3 million. Uh, that's a real terms reduction in staff costs. Um, office costs remain the same. Uh, therefore, uh, there's a reduction there. Uh, centrally managed costs, I think, is what you've just touched on, but if that's not the case, uh, I'd be interested in more information. Uh, if you look at the headline figures on table 14.2, uh, which is uh, the level two spending, there is a £4 million reduction, and I know that's been explained in Mr Harvey's uh, letter. But I would be interested, first of all, in terms of the level three funding, do you accept there is a real term decrease in the funding available, for example, staff costs? It's perhaps more sensible if Mr Harvey responds to that. So the position um, in terms of, so if you perhaps take it hierarchically in terms of the, the initial position in relation to the, the 4 million and then my assessment in relation to the 1.7 and then I'll no, come down no, to the sorry, staffing if I may. No, I'd rather you start with staffing because I'll come on to the other issues. So staffing was my question in this case. Is there a real terms reduction from last year's budget to this year's budget for the amount of money you can spend on staffing? Yes or no? So we have a real terms um, reduction in our perspective um, in, on the uh, revenue budget of um, around £1.4 um, million. Pounds. And our estimate is that 50% um, of uh, that cut in uh, revenue in real terms will have to be achieved by non-staff costs and 50% by staffing costs. So yes, we yes, yes, yes. I'm trying to give more yeah. detail. Yeah, no, no, that's useful, but you know, to get... Um, you know, a clear answer for the record, there is a reduction in the amount of money the Crown Office will be able to spend on staff with this sound settlement which was delivered by the Scottish Government in their words, not mine. So we will have a 1.4 million cut in revenue? Yeah, and 50% of that. Is, so what we're planning for is 50% savings on, on uh, staff costs and 50% on non-staff. And I don't know, maybe this is more for the Lord Advocate. Given the evidence we've received at this inquiry, do you think that's sensible to be going forward with a reduction in staff costs at a time when we've been told by numerous witnesses almost unanimously that, in fact, uh, you need more resources? Uh, no one has questioned the ability of your staff. Indeed, that has been praised time and time again. But it has been said at almost every session that they are under-resourced. And therefore, if you are going to implement a cut in the staffing budget, does that not give concerns for the future of the service this year? I think it's important to, um, when one's thinking about the future of the prosecution service, um, to not, just not to look at it in, 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 in isolation from the wider criminal justice system. Um, as I said a moment ago, we are at a um, moment when we are looking at systemic change, which is likely um, to alter the system um, in ways which will uh, make it much more acceptable from the perspective of victims, witnesses, and, um, and indeed accused persons. Um, 
um, I, I think it's a mistake. It's a mistake to think that uh, one solves um, challenges and difficulties um, simply by putting uh, additional uh, resources into it, well, rather, well, that, that ra may, rather than looking at... Th that may um, be your, the, the your opinion, though. However, what I was trying to get across in my question was the opinion from numerous witnesses to this committee is that more resources are required. If you don't feel that's a requirement, then we'll hear that from you in January. But at a time when all these witnesses are seeing a, an important inquiry, which you said was very uh, timious and you were um, very interested in the outcomes, if we have people who are at the coalface telling us we need more resources, yet they see this budget settlement from the Scottish Government, presumably agreed uh, in consultation with you, that actually sees a reduction in the amount of money you can spend on the staff within that service. I'm not sure how you can marry up those two statements. The, well, because, because for two reasons. First of all, um, the service has... Um, planned for the coming year on the basis of the uh, assumption or the scenario of um, uh, the same cash and revenue and capital terms, and that is the um, settlement that we have achieved. Secondly, in terms of specific um, areas of challenge uh, for the uh, service, I'm interested in looking at uh, ways in which we can um, perform the various functions we have to perform more effectively um, by looking at uh, procedural changes, uh, looking at changes in the way that we do things. Um, I'm interested in uh, the potential, which is very real, for um, changes in the justice system uh, across the piece of which Crown Office is only uh, one part. And all of that has uh, implications for resourcing. I think it's, a, it, 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 it's not correct to think that um, the only way to solve our problem is simply to apply more resources mm, to it. Yeah. But, but can, I, can I just make this clear, uh, Mr. Ross? Um, if, I, if I am satisfied uh, exercising my responsibility as Lord Advocate, that in order to fulfill the fundamental um, functions of the service, I require additional funding from the government, I won't I won't hesitate to ask for it. But you've not and, asked for and, it in the settlement. And, and, and I can um, give an example. Um, uh, in the period of my predecessor's office, when he uh, sought and was given additional funding, which at that time was required specifically to deal with a, a series of significant cases. Mm. Yeah. If, again, um, uh, I'm faced with a specific demand um, a specific need which requires more funding and I'm satisfied that to, in the exercise of my public responsibilities uh, I need more funding for that purpose then I, I, I will ask for it. Yeah. I just I, I worry then that we have a <coughs> scenario where you have to go cap in hand to the Scottish Government asking for more money rather than seeing at this time when you go into your discussions uh, as the independent head of the Crown Office with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance to get a sound settlement which he described it as in Parliament you have uh, reiterated a similar view today, yet the FDA union, when they came to this committee to give evidence, Fiona Eady said, I fully expect our senior manager to give evidence to the parliament and say he can probably just about manage to deliver the same service again with the same money next year with the same money next year. She then went on to say, however, if the committee wants to see the sorts of improvements that we have spoken about today and the standard of service that we all want to deliver and that the people of Scotland expect, additional resources are required. I'm not sure that Fiona Eady, people in the FDA union, or anyone having watched the evidence sessions of this committee or experiencing the uh, issues that have been raised here in the court system up and down the country will take much comfort from your answer today. Yes. Would I like to have more money? Well, there'd be no head of, of, of any public service in Scotland who wouldn't uh, like to have more by way of resources. Can I deliver uh, a, a prosecution service which is uh, fundamentally um, doing the job it is there to do, which is to prosecute crime effectively, rigorously and fairly? Um, with the settlement that we've achieved, uh, I, I believe that uh, I can. Um, if, uh, and I should say that I, I was very pleased, uh, Mr. Ross, that at the outset you you paid, um, you acknowledged the evidence about the quality of the staff in the service, because, and I've, I've been very pleased to read the evidence that you've um, 
uh, received about the quality of the staff because that vindicates, um, vindicates uh, something I've been saying from my very first day in office, which is um, to emphasize the trust uh, and confidence I have in the staff who prosecute on my authority uh, up and down Scotland. Finally, I just wonder, when we, yeah, wonder, maybe just so we can answer both points, because the convener won't give me much more uh, leeway. Can I ask uh, you to also answer, Mr. Harvey, about the uh, element of your submission that speaks about the 0 0.95 million that was transferred in year, um, and that was uh, for Violence Against Women initiative, um, and that will also be provided during 2017-18. If you know that now, why is that not included in the budget figures presented to Parliament? Um, it wasn't included in the budget figure for the initial position last year either. It's because it's received in year. Yep. Uh, so we normally get that around September or October, and we know there's a line in the, uh, the justice budget, and there's a commitment that that, fund, that funding will be delivered. But, but when you speak about the 2016-17 draft budget compared to the actual budget, surely that would be known for this year's draft budget as well yet it's being included after the draft budget settlement. It's, it's received the same treatment as it did last year um, when well, we presented that. Well, that's my question. That. Why should it receive the same treatment as last year? Why can't it just go in? Uh, if you know you're getting that funding, why doesn't that 9.95 million go in? It could equally be presented that way, but yeah. we could, we've presented it consistently as we did last year in, in relation to it being funding that will arrive during the course of the year rather than funding that we, we start the year with. And, and how often have you received that funding? This will be the third year, um, and it's the, the final year of that, that particular funding commitment. Okay. Stephen, so, just sorry, I think Mr Harvey wanted to answer oh, an earlier question. If, if, if I may, convener, um, there, there's also a, a matter about how you spend money, and, and I think it may assist um, a, the committee to, to understand, um, it, regardless of, of, of what funding we have available for staffing, the choices that, that, that are being made. Um, so, um, it may assist the committee to know that um, there are up-to-date figures in relation to numbers of legal staff. We now have 533 members of legal staff. Um, the high point in the entirety of the service was 2009-10 when we had 547, so it's about 14 away from the, the all-time high and is, um, uh, has actually been growing um, each year for the last uh, three or four years. Um, the other thing that, that uh, in terms of... of uh, uh, decisions in relation to frontline staff, um, our, our core staff grades of, of depute and uh, senior uh, depute, since 2009 the figure was 285 and the figure now is 354. So choices are being made within the envelope that is available to us in order to ensure that we uh, invest in, in, in staff who are in the course. A supplementary student, sir? It's a narrow technical point that relates to uh, where Mr Ross started on the relationship between the Lord Advocate and the government. Um, the Scotland Act of 1998, I understand, uh, appoints members to the government under Section 45 of that Act, appointing the First Minister. Section 47 of that Act, which appoints the people we now describe as Cabinet Ministers, but the Act describes as Ministers. People who are appointed under Section 49 is described in the Act, junior ministers are not members of the government. But at no point in the appointment of members of the government does it include the Lord Advocate. So am I correct in assuming that in legal terms you are an advisor to the Scottish Government as well as being head of the prosecution service, but you are not a member of the Scottish Government? That, in fact, is incorrect. Um, right. I, 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 by statute, um, the law officers are members of the Scottish Government in the same way that the Attorney General in England, Wales, is right. a member of the okay. UK Government. Um, but um, the Lord Advocate exercises <coughs> what are called retained functions, which are the functions as head of the system of prosecution and investigation of deaths. Those are functions which the Lord Advocate exercised long before devolution over, over many centuries and which are exercised by statute and constitutionally independently of any other person. Um, and those are the particular functions that we're here to discuss today. So you're a man of two hats, two brains, and you leave some of them outside of the door when you meet with the government as a member of the government? Well, I'm, I'm, I, am, um, I am very clear um, that as head of the system of prosecution and when I exercise my retained functions, the responsibilities rest with me and with me alone. 
Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, John Finney, followed by um, Ron. Hey, thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, thank you for your written evidence and your opening remarks. And I'm glad, Lord Advocate, that you picked up the very clear message we got that there was no criticism whatsoever of the staff, that the highest standards are appreciated that we go through. I'd like to ask uh, a, a few short questions to Mr Harvey, please. And it's picking up on the point that <clears throat> Mr Ross made about this settlement of just under a million pounds for violence against women. Um, and the fact it is recurring. In the paragraph when you allude to that, Mr Harvey, you conclude by saying, and I quote here, this means that whilst it looks as though our cash settlement has decreased and expenditure and staff costs has reduced, in fact it is not. C can you maybe just... In cash terms. In cash terms. In, cash terms. in real terms, I, um, there's, there's undoubtedly a, a decrease in revenue um, a, and a small decrease in capital. The, the figure that was used in, in the briefing, I think, overall was a reference to 4 million, which made reference also to the depreciation sum. The reality is that um, in terms of funding actually available to the service in real terms, our calculation is it's appro approximately 1.5 million in revenue and about 100,000 in capital is the real terms impact. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you for that. I was also going to ask about... Uh, what you refer to as our expected depreciation profile, because you also talk about medium-term financial strategy that, that you were following. And I was just wondering, is the settlement, regardless of its merits, is it within the scope of what you had been considering? It, it is within the scope of, of <coughs> the, the various uh, projections that we had, had considered. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, something I, I was astonished by, and I don't know if it is a misprint, but it's the, the phrase in here, some 7.5% of our budget is currently spent on mortuary and pathology costs. Indeed. Is that correct? Yes. It seems an astonishing figure. It, it's millions of pounds. And wh what opportunity, I know you allude to opportunities, I mean, the, the Christie principles of collaborative working, uh, are they being fully examined in relation to that to reduce that cost? They are being, th th we, we do consider, and that's why we've highlighted it there, that there will be opportunities um, uh, going forward in relation to that service provision. And there has been a petition at this parliament about mortuary facilities. I, I don't know if you're aware of that. Perhaps yeah. that's something, it, it comes from a, a woman in Murray um, and her concerns about facilities. Maybe something you could look at, an opportunity again there, maybe. All, all of those uh, factors would be as part of our consideration going forward in relation to how we deal with those contracts. Um, Thank you. And, and you talk about the appointment of a director of procurement. Is there any projection as to, uh, and that's also in relation to the reletting of contracts and improved bond ca contract management. Um, there's also mention of a telecoms contract that has recently been relet. Are you able to give any indication of savings in relation to that, please? The telecoms contract we anticipate will be uh, saving in excess of 15%. Um, it will also deal with um, some of the issues that the committee has heard with, um, from other witnesses from in relation to the difficulties with the 08 number. It, it will be an 03 number. The 03 number um, uh, enables um, a, a members uh, of the public or, or uh, solicitors who have mobile packages. An 03 number counts towards that for three minutes, etc. And also um, it has the same overall cost as an 01 or an 02 number. Also, uh, finally, Mr Harvey, you, you talk about overall staff numbers will start to reduce. Can you give any indication if that would include fiscal stepute at all? Um, it may, but we would be seeking uh, to uh, avoid that situation where possible. As I said, we've made, made it very clear um, that, uh, this goes back to my answer to Mr Ross, that there are choices available to us in the staffing profile as we go forward. One of the things that we have done uh, in the past, and, and quite dramatic changes, um, there were um, historically, I think, 2009, 39 senior civil servants in the organisation, it's now down to 24. Um, and so those types of choices, I use that simply for illustration, um, and enable us to uh, uh, select, in terms of what we assess our demand might be, what, what the best uh, options would be to deal with that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Rona. Yes, good morning, Lord Advocate and Mr Harvey. Um, I'm very pleased to see that there'll be no compulsory redundancies um, and that you're hoping to achieve, achieve savings through digitisation of processes and sheriff and duty reform. I just wanted to ask you a wee bit about your long-term financial planning. Um, your submission talks about your medium term. Um, <coughs> the Auditor General has told us that she's, she's emphasised the benefits of long-term financial planning. How? Realistic is it for you to be able to do that at this stage? It, 
we, we are engaging in that exercise, and it's actually been a very fruitful one. I, I, I noted with interest the Auditor General's evidence, and um, it, it, it's fair to say that um, having embarked on that exercise, we've found it um, extremely uh, beneficial. We have had extremely uh, significant assistance and advice from uh, both uh, the Auditor General's office, but also uh, from our own internal audit and from our non-executives. Um, and so, as part of the financial sustainability plan, um, there were a number of assumptions, risks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for a variety of different scenarios that were identified. And we have uh, uh, tested those robustly, including with the internal and external auditors and with the non-executives, all of whom were uh, very positive about the approach that we were taking and, and have contributed towards those exercises. So we feel as if we are in a significantly more robust position, um, both in the medium and long term. I think it came out in, in the evidence to the auditor, and I think there was some question um, and debate about the value um, uh, the longer um, out you, you, you look, and I think that that's, that's fair, but the key with that is to, to continue to revisit it. So I, I would regard this as something that um, has been a really positive development um, that certainly has, has assisted us uh, greatly in relation to scenario planning. And it is something that, that we will be constantly revisiting in the months and years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Liam, you wanted to yeah. continue that line of question? Yeah. Um, I think you've, you've heard from a number of members the, the, um, the, the evidence we've received about the quality of the work that's done within the, the, the service. Um, but a constant um, refrain has been around the problems created by having um, such a large number of uh, staff on short-term contracts and I think the Auditor General made the, made the point that uh, in terms of deriving best benefit from the investment you're making in training and all the rest of it, that doesn't seem to be a sound strategy, albeit that I think she recognised, as, um, as has been suggested in the, the evidence to us, that some level of short-term contracts are probably going to be required to manage kind of peaks and flows. Could you perhaps talk um, through in a little more detail what precisely is envisaged in terms of the workforce planning that will allow you um, to move more of the, the staff on to um, uh, or away from short-term contracts? Development, and it's, it's actually one of the things that's been, in a strange way, quite encouraging to hear during the evidence, because as the Lord Advocate touched upon, um, a number of the things that have come out in evidence were already matters that we had been identified and were, were working through, and, and so the workforce uh, uh, strategy uh, had, had already recognised that there was a, a significant issue in relation to the balance of, of, of permanent to, to fixed term staff. Um, for a variety of reasons, um, to do you, obviously, it, it, you, as you've rightly identified, training and retraining costs, but also separately, just that sense of cohesion with teams, people knowing that the people that, that they're working with will be there long term, and, and, and it's worthwhile not only training them, but investing time in, and improving the culture. So I, I, I personally am, am, am a, a determined that that, that, that balance will, will change dramatically. Um, it, it, People will, will comment on the timing. The timing is completely you know, coincidental, um, just in terms of the the, um, a, the, the product of, of that planning now coming to fruition. Um, but as a as an indication in advance of Christmas, which was my intention, I actually sent out a message earlier this week um, indicating that uh, two things. First of all, um, a, in relation to those uh, a staff who are. Um, on a, a, a temporary promotion, and again, that's an issue. There are, there are quite large numbers that are on temporary promotion in percentage terms. Uh, but that's something that um, in the first quarter of, of the financial year we'll be seeking to address in order to identify those posts that are demonstrably permanent and seeking to fill them permanently at that grade. And then separately, and in addition to that, uh, both in terms of the administrative staff and, on, and the legal staff, uh, there are a, 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 there's a similar exercise that requires to be conducted that is, that is now coming to fruition, which we env envisage will enable us to um, a, a recruit in, um, a, a number of staff, a significant number of staff, um, on a permanent basis from within the existing pool um, on a competitive basis. Talk about a, a dramatic change. I mean, I certainly welcome what you're saying, which does seem to uh, go some way to addressing the concerns that we've been uh, hearing uh, over recent weeks. But you talk about a dramatic change against the backdrop of what 
Mr Ross was exploring with you of um, staff reduction costs over the, um, the, the next financial year. How are you accommodating that? What, what's the, if, if, presumably, if it, this is going to put additional stress on your on your staff budget, um, even if it gives you a greater flex, a greater predictability. It gives it gives greater predictability, um, and again, one of the benefits of, of the approach that we've taken is that, that it's it's given us an opportunity to uh, a scenario plan in a situation where. Um, a, the, we, we have the sort of settlement that we have. The reality is we're already paying for these people, if you like, um, and they're already making a significant contribution. The issue is, is um, a, the impact that that would have um, in, in the medium to longer term by making the commitment to make them permanent. So one of the things that we have done is, is looked through uh, the numbers that, 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 that leave the service for other reasons, whether it's retirement, getting jobs elsewhere, etc., through um, natural um, uh, wastage, I think is the term that's used, which is a horrendous term, but you know what I mean. Um, and actually um, e making very, very significant proportions of the temporary staff permanent, still looking at that figure of, of, na of natural departures, we would have the ability to flex in accordance with the, the types of pressures that we've identified this year. Just looking at the, the budget profile over recent years, and, and we heard from the Auditor General, I think, um, criticism in, in, in only the way the Auditor um, General can, can provide it, um, that this really should have been being done from a, a number of years back. Why is it we're seeing the decision to move to more permanent contracts and a greater stability in the service now, when there isn't a great deal of change in the, the budget? Presumably these decisions could have been taken um, two, three years ago at the very least. There, are, there have been some changes in the budget um, that, that help inform that decision. I think there are also just um, a points about decisions having to be made. Um, so, for example, um, there, there was uh, additional funding um, a couple of years ago that has now been uh, baselined in budget, which I think gives us greater certainty. Um, but also beyond that, um, there, is, there is no doubt that um, a we have, I think, reached a critical mass where it has become an issue, and it's a, it's a matter which, on the back of the workforce planning, um, we have a, a, a far greater level of confidence that we can now um, address proactively, and that's what we will be doing in the first just, quarter of the year. And just one other issue, again, that's come up quite routinely through the, the evidence we've taken, uh, is the concern about the implications of the, the move to centralised marking, mm -hmm. and one of the um, arguments in favour of it is, has been um, the additional level of expertise that can be brought um, to bear in, in, in a more centralised system, but also the, the, the efficiencies that it, it gives to the service. Now, given the concerns that we've heard, um, clearly what is in place at the moment, um, to, to my mind, does not appear to be working. What is your view of the, of the efficiencies of the, the savings this system allows you to, to, to generate within the budget? And what would be the financial implications of going, in a sense, back to a, a system where there'd be more uh, localised input or localised marking? I wonder if I might just make a, an introductory comment and let, then let the Crown Agent deal with mm. the more uh, operational aspect of the question. Um, my own view is that um, for a national prosecution service, um, it is not acceptable today to have anything other than national standards and national criteria. The national case marking um, uh, arrangements allow us to secure consistency in the way that uh, marking decisions are made across the country. And it's fair to say, and Crown Agents is better placed now to speak to this, that um, the use of, um, or the make, doing of marking, as it were, away from the local area is not a new phenomenon. Um, it's become systematized in the national case marking arrangements. The arrangements that are in place are able to accommodate particular needs, particular local variations um, through the systems that are in place. Um, but by approaching marking on a national basis, we're able to um, uh, address the need for local variation in a, um, in, a, in a systematic manner, if I put it that way. Does that not kick against the fact that individual judges, individual JPs have done and always will come at issues with a particular perspective that it will influence the way in which 
uh, they, they come to a conclusion. So even with national marking, um, you're still going to find that um, there will be variability in terms of um, what each court comes up with by way of a, a conclusion, maybe not necessarily in the, in the measures. But one of the concerns is there's a lack of understanding about the, uh, the options open um, uh, to, to dealing with a particular case because it's centrally, centrally well, marked. Well, 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 my understanding is that the systems in place are, are, are able to accommodate and provide the relevant information to those doing the marking. Um, I'm making the more... Uh, perhaps the more fundamental point, which is that um, for a national prosecution service, it seems to me right that we approach um, criminality across Scotland in a consistent manner. Um, so, you know, I'd like to, you know, I, think, I, th I think it's important we'll, that We'll I come say back that. to this in January, because I know sure we're straying we into that, but yes. the budgetary elements of this, I think, are I think probably more relevant. Well, we, we will come back to this in January, and we yeah. welcome um, the, the opportunity to discuss in more detail, but I think there's a fundamental point we need to make to start, which was the um, this, this wasn't a binary situation of um, uh, individual uh, cases being marked in 40-odd you know, offices across the country and then all of a sudden in national hubs. Uh, the reality is that um, centralised marking in a variety of different forms has, has existed um, within the service for um, many years um, and indeed under the previous federation structure, which I think you've heard uh, some evidence about as well, there were, there were federation um, hubs as well. So there was a logical extension in the creation of that model. And I think that um, a, a, one of the misconceptions that has been uh, in some of the evidence, which again, I'd be happy to touch on more in, in detail in January, um, is that, that, that all of a sudden, as a result of the creation um, of, of NICP, um, that, that, that um, in some way this meant that there was a, a loss of local contact. The building of, of, of NICP was very carefully developed um, in order to try and, and ensure that, that the localism um, was protected. There is a preponderance of, of diversion schemes uh, across the country. And again, I think that's something that it would be helpful as a justice committee if perhaps it's, we could talk about in, in January in the context of a national marking hub I'm appreciating what is available in local areas and also whether or not there's an issue about um, the availability of certain options in local areas. Um, uh, but you know, that's, a, that's a matter that we can discuss then. Um, but it's fair to say from, from our perspective, one of the key benefits in terms of efficiencies, etc., is actually you've got an identifiable group of people who, for example, in relation to the prosecution policy review, when you introduce a change in policy, you have a targeted group of, of individuals who you can in introduce with intensive training and they are responsible for the vast bulk of the marking that's then created as opposed to um, having to uh, uh, train larger numbers as intensively. So that there are a variety of things, not just in relation to um, uh, efficiencies on, on, uh, in relation to numbers, but also going forward, the ongoing costs of supporting that model um, creates in itself some efficiencies. Um, I would like to say, though, that, that the, um, the staff in NICP, in keeping with um, the evidence that you've heard, um, a, have, have done extraordinarily well with a new model. But we are also not insisting that the model, as defined, isn't capable of refinement. And one of the things that's been really beneficial from the inquiry is to, to look at the evidence that does relate to that, and that will be fed in in relation to uh, seeking to further improve that approach. Yeah, I think the point specifically that's been raised in evidence is the fact that central marking would dispose of a case in a certain way. It might be a fixed penalty fine. Um, the person may appear several times thereafter um, not paying that fixed penalty fine. And there could have been local disposals that perhaps centrally, um, as a result of them being centrally marked, they weren't aware of, that would more effectively have dealt with that case. And the budgetary um, position here, the financial implication is people are turning up time and time again unnecessarily, perhaps at a local level, um, because it hasn't been dealt with properly. And the indication we, we, we received was because there wasn't a knowledge of the, the potential and possible referrals that could have been made. So is that something that you've taken on board from the inquiry? I've, I've heard that evidence. Um, I've also seen the supporting evidence. So, for example, there was some evidence about um, the decreased use of diversion schemes, but then when the evidence was submitted that didn't really demonstrate that level of decrease, it suggested that there was the, the knowledge was still there. Um, I think that was the SACRO evidence, um, where a, a large number of the, the, the um, options that were available, actually the numbers appeared to have increased. 
Um, so it, it, I think that, again, it's perhaps something that we can explore in further detail in January. In terms of the, the availability of diversion schemes, um, uh, suitable diversion schemes are something that, that I personally, and I know um, uh, prosecutors uh, across the country, are enthused about um, as, as a constructive way of, of uh, uh, dealing with criminality to uh, uh, avoid, prevent, uh, avoid uh, repetition. Um, uh, but insofar as, as the, the, the penalties are concerned, as and when those uh, uh, penalties are awarded, um, it's fair to say that the figures that we have, which again I'm very happy to provide to the committee, indicate that I think there was a suggestion that people were just getting repeated um, uh, 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 fixed penalty notices or fiscal fines. And I think we have some information there in relation to um, uh, the numbers that might assist the committee in more detail. Possibly best if I don't go into them just now, but um, I, I think we might be able to provide you with some reassurance in relation to their use and the recovery. Do the, um, or does the uh, amount of unpaid fines cause you some concern? Um, I think the evidence, again, from, from Mr. McQueen, um, uh, was that the, 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 evidence, the evidence was that the recovery was about 80%. Um, and um, I think that in relation to court fines, the, the numbers are slightly higher. Um, forgive me, I don't have that evidence to hand. And in monetary terms? In monetary terms? How much isn't collected? Well, from record, well, it would be 20%. I don't know what that figure would be. Yeah, are we going into millions? I don't know. I, I, I don't have that figure, but I'll get that figure for you in general. Perhaps that would be a good yeah. figure to see because 80% um, sounds very good. But equally, if there's um, millions then being unpaid, then that, that's money that could be into the system. Um, could I ask Mary Fee and then Fulton? Thank you, convener, and good morning. Apologies for the voice. I'll, I'll try not croak too much. Um, I wanted to ask a further question about the savings that you plan to make from, from staff costs. Um, Given the huge legislative changes there's been in the last few years that have affected the way the Crown Office works and further changes in legislation that will have an impact on the work of the, the Crown Office, are you confident that given the size of the savings that you have to make, there will be no impact on the service you provide, but also that you will be able within the budget to properly train and support the staff that you have to carry out um, the services that they do, and, and given that there will be an increase in specialist services and specialist courts, which adds another dimension, are you confident that you have enough, given the savings you're going to have to make? Yes. Perhaps I could, again, just make a couple of high-level observations and then um, ask the Crown Agent to, uh, to comment <coughs> specifically. I, I suppose the first point to make is that um, this is a service which has absorbed remarkable um, changes uh, over the course of my professional lifetime. I was an advocate deputy when we were dealing with the arrival of um, disclosure with um, the effects of um, Saldus and Kader. Um, mm. uh, it's a service which um, was at the forefront of, of um, recognizing the needs of, of victims of crime and responding to them. Um, so it's a service that, um, uh, in the course of my professional lifetime, has um, embraced change, has absorbed uh, um, significant changes, um, and I have every reason to be confident that it's a service that um, uh, will go on being able to uh, adapt to, to change and to uh, deal with the challenges that um, the, 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 the that face it. So, so that's a, a general observation about the capacity of the organisation and its um, uh, approach to the changing environment. Um, in terms of specialism, um, uh, you're absolutely right that the uh, world is becoming more specialist. Um, within the COPFS there are now um, specialist units that deal with a variety of different uh, aspects of criminality. Um, uh, Scotland was, uh, I think, at the forefront um, uh, in relation to sexual offending by setting up the National Sex Crimes Unit. Um, so um, specialism, again, is something that the service has, has shown itself um, comfortable with, if I can put it, put, put, put it that way. Uh, I think as one goes forward and, and looks at um, uh, future legislative change, I think the, the one, has to look, one will have to look at each um, uh, 
set of proposals um, uh, on its own merit. There, there will be changes which will um, impose demands on the service and there will be changes, particularly if one's looking at the broader potential of, of criminal justice reform and the kind of work that's being done through the Scottish Court Service Evidence and Procedure Review. There, there may be changes that will um, have benefits for the public at large and may, may alter the, the kind of work that the service needs to do. So, 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 I, so I, 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 I think it would be very difficult to give any sort of short answer other than to say that um, this is a service which has shown itself able to absorb um, uh, changes in the external environment, changes in legislation, uh, uh, and um, uh, I'd have confidence that it would continue to do so. But the Crown Agent may wish to add his own remarks. I agree with you in relation to the importance of training um, and um, it perhaps might assist the committee um, in contrast to 2011 we've increased the amount of money that we spend on training to by 75% um, that's across a range of, of, of different topics not only the specialisms that the Lord Advocate has pitched up uh, has, has referred to but also uh, in relation to uh, other matters like uh, the development of our of our managers and our leaders within the organisation, so that we we, we do uh, invest in in training. Um, and so far as uh, the legislation going forward is concerned, um, for example, in relation to the new domestic abuse bill, um, we are in discussion with with Scottish government officials in in preparing a financial memorandum for that bill, and, and those discussions are ongoing. Okay. So, in, in relation to the budget that you have for training, is a is the budget for training increasing while the budget for staff costs is decreasing? Um, it's, we have managed to increase the, the, the budget uh, on training um, uh, by uh, 75% um, during the course of the five-year period that I've described. Uh, but at the same time, you'll recall that during the five years that I've described, we were also able to increase staffing numbers. So against um, the, 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 the budget constraints that we've already um, uh, had to deal with over the last uh, several years. Um, we have actually been able to make, I, I would suggest, some very positive choices uh, in relation to investing in training and investing in staff. We now have over 1,600 full-time equivalent staff again, which, again, if you look at the, the, the pattern over the last uh, three to five years, is actually uh, an increase notwithstanding uh, the constraints that we've, we've, we've uh, been sub subject to. So it's, it's about making... Um, intelligent choices within what's available to us. Thanks, Lord Advocate and hey, Mr Harvey for attending today. My, my um, question is, uh, has already really been covered and it kind of falls on from Mary Fee's question. I mean, obviously, you've identified that you need to live in the current financial um, circumstances and the, the, the funding cuts that's coming um, from the, the Westminster government are well documented. Can I ask, though, in terms of the specialist um, um, areas, are you confident in continuing to meet and develop the, um, the domestic violence um, agenda and continuing to prosecute in the vein that you have been over the, over the past period? Thank you. Um, uh, the short answer is yes. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can elaborate on that if you yes, would like. Yes, aye, uh, please, sir. Um, um, and, and I'm conscious we may be. You know, there are a number of issues that have been raised in the course of the evidence uh, in, in your inquiry, which you may wish to come back and discuss with us. Um, so, so uh, sorry, I should have said, yeah, um, in, in my opening remarks, that I, I'm talking specifically about the funding yes. that you're getting for the, the um, violence against against women. Yes. Um, and if that is enough to maintain the current standard of prosecution. Well, uh, as the Crown Agent said, I mean, we, 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 we expect of the same... Um, uh, funding in year transferred to um, support uh, the work on violence against women and that's a, a specific piece of funding um, directed to um, uh, seeking to ensure that these cases are dealt with as expeditiously as possible and, and the figures would support the view that, that it's been successful in that, in, in that regard. I have no reason to believe that 
um, we won't continue to be able to do that. If, if I may expand a, bit, a, a little more detail. Um, so we have, we have the funding for a further year. Um, it, it might assist the committee if, if I give some of the, the, the tangible benefits that, that, that have resulted from that £2.4 million in funding each year to ourselves and the court service. Um, part of it is allocated to the court service, part of it has been uh, allocated to COPFS and that has enabled us uh, to recruit uh, additional um, uh, prosecutors and administrative staff uh, specifically for these purposes. Um, it, it, it involved a, a, a lot of, of, of uh, excellent joint work with, with the court service and uh, the net result is that um, in, in the first uh, two years um, the um, number of sheriff court trials uh, outstanding dropped from 23,500 to 16,900 um, and in the JP courts from 11,800 to just over 9,000 which is a collective reduction of just under 9,500 trials. Um, and in terms of additional courts during that two year period that wouldn't otherwise have been able to run, um, there were 647 extra Justice of the Peace courts and um, over 1,100 extra Sheriff courts. So if, if it assists um, uh, the committee, that's an example of what 2.4 million pounds buys. Okay, just to follow up to that without, um, without hopefully straying too much into questions that may be more appropriate for our uh, next session, do you think that the, the focus on domestic violence and the focus that you've discussed there um, would, could help to reduce it and have a cultural um, change in the future, thereby, I know we're thinking long term here, but thereby reducing the amount of people that come to court for these type of offences because we change behaviour, we change attitudes um, towards this type of offence. Yeah, so in that, you're, you're focusing there very much on the policy question, which is one for, for, for me, yeah. and um, I, I think there are perhaps two or maybe three points to make. The, the first is that this is an area of criminality which for far too long wasn't taken sufficiently seriously by the criminal justice system. Um, the second point to make is that when I or the service prosecute um, a domestic abuse case, we prosecute it because a crime has been committed. And I take the view that it is correct um, where there is sufficient evidence in law um, to have strong presumptions in favour of prosecution of this particular type of offending. Uh, I say that um, firstly because of the impact that it has on victims uh, and um, other members of, of a family, particularly children. Um, but I also say it because, uh, as, uh, as you uh, uh, allude to, against the background of the way historically I think these offend th this type of offending was dealt with, it is important the criminal justice system sends out a very clear message about what's acceptable and what, more importantly, what's not acceptable uh, in uh, today's Scotland. If I could just press you a little bit more on that, um, Lord Advocate, you've dealt, dealt that cases are dealt with expeditiously and there's a strong presumption in favour of, of prosecution, but surely that can't be, as the defence agents have said, where um, there's a per perception that the prioritisation of domestic abuse cases in the context of scarce resources meant that money was sometimes being wasted on cases with little prospect of conviction uh, at the expense of other summary cases. Now, clearly, if that was the case, that's not in anyone's interest. It doesn't make sense financially. It certainly doesn't make sense in emotional terms for the victim um, or for um, witnesses, anyone involved. Um, all, all of that is, 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 is correct, if that were the case, uh, convener. First point I want to make very clear um, is that um, a prosecution should not be brought in relation to any case unless there is sufficient evidence in law. There have been suggestions, I think, in at least one witness's evidence that uh, uh, that, 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 um, that, that basic proposition is not one that's adhered to. 
certainly from my point of view, that's the starting point uh, here. Um, the strong presumption for prosecution presupposes that there's sufficient evidence uh, in law. Um, the second point that I'd like to make is that if one looks at the statistics um, uh, in the cases, domestic abuse cases that went to trial last year, a conviction was secured in 80 percent, 80 percent. Now, I don't think it will be lost on the committee that these are cases which are maybe inherently difficult to prosecute. They are cases where for reasons which will be intelligible, um, <coughs> complainers are not always, uh, who, who may initially um, uh, engage, with the, uh, engage with the system may um, become uh, unwilling or less willing to give evidence. Notwithstanding these particular difficulties in these particular types of cases, um, last year um, convictions were secured in 80% of the cases that went to trial. That doesn't suggest to me that there's a, 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 a serious, that, that, that the kind of problem that you're describing is one which is um, uh, causing the kind of difficulties um, sy systemically that, 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 that I think um, you, the question that you've asked convener might convey. I think there'll probably be more questions than that in, in uh, January, but it was to, to, to look at the budgetary at the expense um, yes. of summer cases, which brings me on to churn, if I could just perhaps pursue that for a minute. Um, do you accept there is churn in the court that this comes at a cost, and how would you address it? Um, I, I certainly accept that, particularly in summary cases, um, uh, uh, there is churn. There are a variety of reasons. Uh, a variety of reasons for it. Um, the, the fundamental answer is to um, uh, look at systemic reform. And I, I would certainly commend um, a reading of Part A of the Scottish Court Services Evidence and Procedure Review, which sets out um, the vision that the Court Service has for summary justice reform, uh, and uh, which um, is work which uh, Crown Office is very actively engaged in with other criminal justice partners. Can I put to you what Derek Ogg told us when he gave the evidence? Derek Ogg from the Faculty of Advocates suggested that the decision to make less use of precognitions based on the lack of resources could actually prolong cases, thus waiting, uh, wasting resources. Um, there has been a change in the approach to precognition. Um, that change um, followed on the radical changes in the law on disclosure. Um, and the current policy is, um, follows what's called purpose-driven purpose recognition. In other words, um, rather than a recognition process which, um, in which the um, Crown Office uh, interviews witnesses who have already given police statements. Um, uh, the decision to recognise a witness should be based on 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 a view that there's a particular need to um, recognise a witness in addition to the police statements which have already been obtained and which are available uh, to the uh, to the to the accused and his uh, his defence agents. Um. Again, it's something that we'll pursue in, in January, but I think there is perhaps a, a certain art to, to recognition, which maybe the police don't always have. But that's something maybe... If it's perhaps have. something to pursue further in, in, in January. I mean, I, I understand the point that's been, be, be, been made, but um, uh, the, uh, you know, if, if the question is, um, is this a change which is... Um, driven by financial considerations, well, it, it, it predated my time. The Crown agent may be able to say more about it, but my understanding, it was a, it was a deliberate policy decision taken against the background of a, the radical change in practice that followed uh, from the, um, law of dis the change in the law of disclosure. Well, in answering perhaps, Mr. Harvey, you could address whether, if it wasn't taken for financial reasons, perhaps it's having an impact now financially. Um, so it wasn't taken for financial reasons, it was taken as Lord Advocate has said in relation to changes in disclosure, it also 
for, for good or bad, um, it reflected the realities of the way in which uh, trials are conducted uh, these days, particularly, um, I think it's colloquially known as trial by statement. Um, uh, and so therefore, uh, witness positions um, have become now traditionally crystallised in police statements that can be put to witnesses, which a recognition can't. And one of the key issues was um, in ensuring that we uh, obtempered our, our very um, uh, onerous um, and important disclosure obligations um, in a way that enabled um, the defence to have uh, all of the material and then have that material in a format that enabled them to, to put it to witnesses. So there were all sorts of positive reasons um, for, for going down the, the route that we've described. And it's not an, an abandonment of recognition, it's about more focused recognition where we think that that recognition will add value. So, for example, in relation to serious sexual offending cases, um, th those cases, it's, it's, it's um, highly likely, if not nearly always, that the, that, that individual would be um, uh, recognised. Um, insofar as, as the, 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 the cost and the impact is concerned, I think that that, that um, is, is completely intangible because of the way in which the the, the, the way a, a trial was conducted has changed so dramatically since uh, disclosure and then since particularly uh, the provision of, of, of these police statements that um, the, the, the value or otherwise of, of what recognition may or may not added, have added is, is, is speculative. Can I put something quite tangible that sure. we all saw when we went to the Sheriff Court and that was... Um, many of the procurator fiscals not having the information in front of them, not being prepared, and the recognitions would greatly help them um, to come to court in the first instance, totally prepared with all the information they need and therefore avoid the churn. Um, if it, you're talking about in sheriff summary cases, there never was any recognition um, uh, of, of witnesses. Um, in relation to sheriff and jury cases, there was some uh, limited recognition, and in high court cases, traditionally, there was significantly more recognition. So again, um, <coughs> in terms of, of perception and understanding about what, what was available, certainly when I started as, as, as a deputy 20 years ago, um, when I was prosecuting the summary courts, I had, had uh, uh, the police report and, and such police statements as were available, and that, that remains the position in the summary courts. Very um, quickly on that supplementary, then Ben, uh, Douglas and Mary. Uh, and I think I'll let Mary in before Douglas after that. Uh, Mary, uh, supplementary, very small. It's a very, very brief supplementary, and it's just on the issue that you raised, convener, about churn. I wonder if, if it's possible to put a figure on the amount of resource that, that, that churn wastes. And apologies if there is something in the papers that I've just not picked up. I apologise. But is it possible to put a figure on that? The, I'm certainly going to pass that question to the Crown Agent. The, 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 best, the best figure um, in terms of for the overall system um, uh, that, that, that um, I've seen is the, the £10 million figure in the Audit Scotland report mm. uh, on uh, the, the working of the Sheriff Court, which I think was published um, tail end of 2015. But I'm, I'm talking specifically about churn, because churn wastes that, that, a lot that, of time. That, 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 was, that was the figure that they Thank attributed you. to. It was £10 million per Thank annum you. for the entirety of the system. Followed by Mary and then Douglas. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. The, one of the common themes that's come up in the evidence that we've taken, particularly from victims of crime, has been how important uh, support for victims and witnesses is. And I, I was interested to see in Table 7.3 of the, the draft, at uh, 7.13, uh, rather, of the draft budget, that uh, support for victim and witnesses is near tripling, uh, up to 15.8 million an increase of 10.4 million. Is my understanding that some of that f uh, money will be allocated to third sector organisations that do uh, such important work in this field? But I just wondered uh, if you could comment on what impact you think that increase will, will make to the service. Perhaps, perhaps that, I, I'll let Crown Agent uh, answer that, but, 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 but perhaps introduce that by um, um, affirming the importance, as you allude to, of um, providing uh, appropriate support uh, to victims. Um, uh, my own view is that as prosecutors, we can't do our job uh, unless we give uh, confidence to victims that they will be enabled to speak up through the justice system. And so it is an important part of the work that prosecutors do. Um, 
we can't provide all the support that victims need because our primary obligation is to prosecute uh, crime uh, and that's perhaps an issue we may have to come back to um, uh, 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 when we come back on, in, in January. But um, with that, by way of a, a sort of policy uh, introduction, uh, perhaps the Crown Agent can answer the specifics of the question. If I may preface my remarks by simply saying I, I, I would put, like to put on record my, my um, thanks to, to VIA staff who uh, regularly uh, deal with um, uh, victims and witnesses in incredibly distressing circumstances. Um, and, and that is a particularly uh, challenging role in the organisation. Um, and, and echo the Lord Advocate's point that um, looking at it from a system perspective, whether the individual who is um, involved in the system is a witness, um, a, a victim or an accused, we, we, we want that person to be able to give of their best um, through the entirety of the process. And it's, it's important that, that there are um, mechanisms in place to, to help them support through that, that, that alien environment, um, which I think um, we would all accept that it is for, for many individuals that are, that are involved in it. Um, I do think, however, as the Lord Advocate said, that there are um, uh, uh, some issues that we need to address at a system level. And again, would welcome discussion at committee level about the role of VIA and the role of the prosecutor in uh, providing that level of support and what that level of support should be and the extent to which other support requires to be available. And I use this word importantly consistently across the country um, uh, in order to ensure that the individuals who find themselves in that situation are um, assisted in being able to give um, of their best and supported through the system. Um, insofar as, as VIA itself is concerned, um, a, a, again, just for, for information in terms of the, the level of commitment that, that the COPFS uh, has in this area, um, you, I think the, the committee will be familiar that um, VIA is in relative terms in the history of COPFS relatively new. It was only introduced in, in, in 2004 and at that stage it was um, innovative and, and um, was, was, was one of the first in, in the world where we were off, a prosecution service was offering um, a, a level of, of support and advice and information uh, to victims. And so of the 1,600 full-time equivalent staff, um, about 103, 104 of them are actually engaged in that activity on our behalf. So about one in 16 of our staff are, are via support staff. And again, in so far as, as the choices that are being made in relation to the use of those funds are concerned. Um, the band C and D staff, the ones who are dealing with, with the, the more serious um, a, a criminality and supporting victims um, through the more serious criminality. Um, again, we've been in a position where we've been able to, to increase the headcount of, of individuals providing those services, again, making choices about, about how we use funds. Just to be, to be clear, so that ex extra funding w will uh, partially go towards recruitment of, of more VIA staff in order we, to, to we support will, that we, work or those decisions still no, to no, be so made? No, the, no. The, the extra funding that's identified in, in other budget lines does not come to COPFS. These will be for other service providers, and that's why I'm saying about yep. the role of VIA and the role of other service providers. And the line that would be appropriate constitutionally for a prosecution service to offer a level of support, but acknowledging those understandable and legitimate expectations, the needs of, of, of victims and witnesses beyond those um, parameters. Um, and so it's, it's encouraging um, that, that, that that funding will be available, but it will not directly um, okay. uh, come to COPFS, albeit I would hope that we would benefit and that everyone in, in, in society would benefit from the investment in individuals feeling more supported as they go through this alien process. Understood, and, and thanks for clarifying that point. I look forward to discussing in, in the new year around the, the policy and systemic potential for Good. greater supporting uh, witnesses and victims. Thank you. Thank you, convener. I mean, my initial question was actually answered by the Lord Advocate. It was a supplementary to your own, and it was to specifically ask about what the conviction rates were for domestic abuse cases. So thank you very much for providing that figure. And uh, it was really uh, following on from uh, Ben McPherson's line of, of questioning there, and it was specifically about VIA and what you've talked about in your evidence here, because obviously speaking to uh, victims who've either been through the service, I mean, you can only imagine how disorienting it is uh, trying to navigate around that system. And... Uh, 
I, I don't think that uh, reports on VIA were always the most positive. And it was really how you talk about the 60 recommendations there and, and how the implementation of that is underway. I'm not expecting you to outline all the 60 recommendations here, but just what sort of areas are you looking at in terms of that and how is the implementation of that progressing? So it's a phased implementation and so there will be um, uh, further recommendations that will require to be implemented during the course of the next calendar year. Um, one of the, the, f the first elements was, I, th I think I, it's also highlighted in evidence that um, as part of our move back towards a, a sheriffdom focused uh, local court delivery, there required to be a, 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 a reframing of, of, of the VIA structure to accommodate that. But also perhaps um, more significantly, um, in, in light of, of, of recent legislative changes, the, the, um, the numbers of, of referrals uh, that VIA are dealing with have gone up quite dramatically. And I think, again, that that's referred to in, in some of the additional information that I think we provided to uh, the committee at, 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 on the, at the earlier stage. You'll recall that there were a series of fact sheets, and I would refer you to, to those in relation to the detail rather than going over those today in relation to the additional challenges that they face. So part of that was to identify ways in which um, the, the, the processes could be simplified in order to accommodate um, the, the increase on, in demand um, at, 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 uh, for, for particular types of, of, of interaction whilst ensuring that those who require the personal <coughs> levels of support um, uh, uh, still, uh, still maintain that. So it's, it's striking that balance um, between ensuring that, um, for example, in relation to those who are um, deemed vulnerable and who therefore are entitled to support that those matters are, are dealt with as expeditiously and effectively as possible, whilst ensuring that there's a focus on those who require additional support. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, I do have more questions on that, but I think they're probably more appropriate mm -hmm. for the next yeah. session. Uh -huh. I'm going to bring uh, Ron in before I bring Douglas in to um, just cover a, a, an aspect that we know we haven't fully covered. Thank, thank you, Convener. Um, the presentation of Crown Office funding in the draft budget includes a breakdown of type of activity, for example, in relation to staff costs, etc. Can you provide, or are you able to provide us with a breakdown of um, work by, by area of work, for example, summary cases, solemn cases, or marking, is it possible for you to highlight the, the funding uh, allotted to them? We will be able to do that in more detail, but just by way of headline, the last, the last figures that we have for that um, in relation to actual spend as opposed to projected spend were 14, 15. Um, and I, can, I could give you those just now broadly if that helps, or, or perhaps the convener would prefer if we followed that up in writing. That would be helpful if you did. Writing would be yeah. fine. Thank because you. we're getting to the end of our uh, session, so can the questions and answers be brief, please? There are two final points, if I may. First of all, on uh, your estate, you say in your submission that non-staff costs after them, sorry, of the non-staff cost, the estate is the highest. The only mention of the estate in the budget document is about incorporating the uh, carbon management plan within it. Uh, but you go on in your submission to the committee to say that savings will be made here. Uh, I wonder what percentage and value have you put on reducing your estate? And could you give further examples? I presume you've not just targeted out with the central belt because in your submission it only mentions Dundee, Aberdeen and Perth. So I wondered what else was happening elsewhere in the country. There are a number of options that develop um, as, as, as each year um, progresses. Um, so, for example, when there are lease breaks <coughs> um, uh, over the next four to five years, there will be opportunities to discuss and have choices about whether or not those leases should be renegotiated, whether or not um, a, a different venue should be identified, what the, the footprint requirement will be at those times, and we will be seeking to take uh, those opportunities as we go along. And I think uh, Perth is the classic example of that, where the, the footprint um, in terms of a state um, in, ter in terms of staff numbers that are in Perth um, at the moment doesn't need to be as big as it, as it currently is. And have you set a target in how much money you should save in that term or percentage of your estate that will be reduced? I haven't set a target because what, I, what I've asked for um, is um, an analysis of what those options look like because part of the reason why um, the... A, the, the estate choices will be informed by some of the, the staffing choices as well. So it, it means that we have a, a richer picture of, of information, but I haven't, I haven't set a specific target for savings attached to estate as yet. Uh, and finally, could I ask that the Lord Advocate, um, in your direct dealings uh, with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance over this budget, 
we are very interested in obviously our inquiry. I think you've both mentioned how interested you have been in it. It has received a widespread uh, publicity in terms of the evidence that we have received. What direct onus was placed on the evidence we have received at this inquiry in your discussions, either from you or from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, when you were discussing reducing the real terms budget for COPFS? It would be, I'm sorry, I'm making a mistake with the buttons here. Um, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to go into the, the detail of um, discussions which I have with um, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I can say that he is well aware that this inquiry is ongoing. C can you say that the evidence which I alluded to in my opening questions, highlighting concerns over resources, were fully explored before the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, in direct dealings with yourself, took the decision to reduce the budget to the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service in real terms? Uh, as I said, I don't think it would be right for me to get into the discussions that I have with the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you for that. Um, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, just a tiny wee point. Um, it appeared to be suggested that uh, fines come back to benefit the justice system. I can't quite recall where they go. Am I correct in saying they go to the Treasury? <coughs> the, um, the fines go to Treasury. Um, and, uh, but, but other items go to other places, but fines go to Treasury. Uh, well, I, I realise that poker, for example, yes. is covered by a different yes. jurisdiction yes. where a capped amount is retained in Scotland. So f whether fines are paid or not is quite immaterial to the funding that there is for the criminal justice system in Scotland. That's all I wanted. Thank you. I realised that as soon as I said it, having looked at that in some detail and looked at the amount of outstanding sum uh, figures and fines, which is not insubstantial, but I suppose the point is there is a churn continuing as the non-payment, and there certainly is a cost to, um, attached to that. There were only um, two other questions, both related, that we haven't covered, and this will be the last. The committee's been told that the preparation of court cases is not a job that can be done in normal office hours with prosecutors <coughs> regularly taking homework to avoid being ill-prepared. Is that the situation you're aware of? And I wonder if you could at the same time address staff organisations having highlighted concerns about the impact of work pressures on staff morale and sickness levels and um, perhaps indicating what's been done about this because clearly there's a huge cost implication and emotional implication in all of these as well. Perhaps again I could make a couple of observations and let the Crown Agent answer in detail, conscious as I am of the pressure of time. I mean, The, the first point to reiterate is the, um, is, is, the, is the point that's already been made by a number of people that the, the, the quality of the staff Absolutely, uh, that's in the Crown the Office Lord and, and, and yep. the trust that I have yep. in the judgment and professionalism of all the staff who prosecute on my behalf. Um, I recognise that um, the work of a prosecutor is a challenge, challenging. It's a challenging job. Um, in terms of morale, I I'm, was very heartened to see the most recent um, civil ser service um, survey on the Crown Office. Um, in which uh, I think it's fair to say all the numbers are moving in the right direction. Um, there's still work to be done, um, but um, uh, uh, the, the numbers are, are, uh, are going in the right direction. And, and just to pick out a few examples, 56% um, of members of staff reported that they had an acceptable workload. Now, I think what, what, what's important about that uh, figure is that it's a 15% improvement on last, the last survey, and it's only 2% below the civil service average. So while one would like to see that um, move, move up, um, it's a figure which um, is um, going firmly in the right direction. Can I ask uh, when the last survey was? What, what kind of time frame are we talking I about? I think we're talking about a one year. One year. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, 67% reported that they have a good work-life balance, and that's up 11% from last year and is uh, on the civil service uh, average. Uh, and then um, going to questions about um, 
working for COPFS, 60% uh, reported that they wanted to stay working for COPFS for at least the next three years. That's up 6% and is 17% 17, 17 above the civil ser service average uh, and 9% above the civil service high performers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th those figures to me um, um, uh, uh, you know, are, 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 are encouraging. But every person um, in the fiscal service uh, has obviously a story to tell. So while percentages may be of encouraging, um, do you accept there's still an issue to be addressed? Of course, and and you know, one of the one of the um, uh, jobs that I have as the new head of the service is to um, is to reinforce to staff the value I place on the work that they do, the trust I have in them. Um, the importance of the professionalism and the dedication uh, that they show. Yeah. Okay. I don't that, know whether the Crown Agent uh, would unless like... Unless you want to add anything, Mr Harvey? There was obviously quite a lot of detail there, so I, um, it's hard to add additional detail, but, but insofar, as, as, insofar as I can, um, the, the other thing to bear in mind is that, that part of the way of addressing this is at a system level. So, for example, in October of that same month, um, if you look across the, the sheriff courts in the country on any given day, in terms of appointments, if you like, places that the prosecutor had to be, that varied between 85 and 120 um, uh, on any given day across October. So one of the, the things that we, we are working alongside the court services is, is actually trying to uh, uh, st stop these peaks in demand, um, uh, which create an impact and a pressure um, a, on the entirety of the system, including on prosecutors. And the other way that we're seeking to mitigate that, referring to my earlier answer, is to ensure that th those who most regularly appear in the courts, go back to the figures um, in relation to deputies and senior deputies, two, 285 in 2009, 354 in 2016. So um, in terms of numbers, that's what, an extra 68, 69 um, in contrast to, to 2009. So again, trying to make those choices in order to uh, allow um, as much flexibility as, as is possible within the constraints that, that, that are, um, are applied. And always mindful of the work-life balance. Uh, absolutely, and it was, it was encouraging to, 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 to see those results in the survey, but I'm, I'm all too conscious that, that that's um, just a, a step in a journey and that there's a, there's a considerable way to go. And perhaps in the next session, um, we might have an opportunity to discuss in, in some more detail the Fair Futures work that we're doing, in particular in and around uh, well-being. The most recent staff absence figures have shown a slight drop, which is encouraging, but I, I take nothing from that. It's still far too high. Okay. Thank you very much. That's been a comprehensive uh, session. We look forward to seeing you again in January. I suspend to allow for a change of witnesses.
Our next item is item three, evidence session for the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service Inquiry. This is our seventh week of evidence taking on the COPFS Inquiry. And I welcome today's witnesses to the committee's evidence session, Michelle McLeod, M Michelle McLeod HM, Chief Inspector of Prosecution in Scotland, and Don Lewington, Assistant Inspector HM, Inspector of Prosecution in Scotland. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk, and paper four, um, which is a private briefing from SPICE, and to the written submissions from the Chief Inspector, which is very much appreciated and with that invite questions from members can i start by asking how long is your term of office um my term of office is an appointment of three years and with uh, an option for that to be extended um, and i was um, fortunate enough to have that um, uh, option extended so i have a further period of about um, two and a half years until the conclusion of my term okay thank you any questions, Mary? Thank you, Convener. I would really just like to tease out a bit more about some of the, the current work that you're involved in and what you do and how that actually uh, reports back and how that information gets out to the public. Because I think that one of my main concerns from seeing all the evidence that we've had so far is that very few people are aware of the work that you do. So I was really just wondering yeah, what you are doing and how you intend to tackle that problem. Um, yes. Um, from looking at the submissions and, and listening to the evidence, um, I have to accept that um, there seems to be an issue with or the uh, um, awareness of the inspectorate and our profile. Um, if I could just advise, um, we, we have a remit to look at any part of the operation of COPFS and the purpose of being to obviously enhance the service for the public of Scotland and to promote excellence in, in, the, in the service. Um, I act entirely independently in publishing and preparing the reports, um, but the Lord's Advocate can require the inspector to um, undertake a review or inspection of a particular subject, um, and I can also choose to undertake uh, a review of a particular subject. And we do that um, on the basis of looking at areas where we perceive the most risk um, in terms of reputational damage, in terms of um, resourcing, as the committee have been discussing this morning, and in terms of um, for for the effect of prosecution of crime. And there's a number of factors that we would take into account when looking to analyse risk, current trends, performance data, um, and the views of stakeholders in the Justice Board and in the criminal justice system <coughs> generally. Um, we publish all our reports. We have a dedicated um, website which we publish them and they get published through the Scottish Government comms with a press release. Um, we do get some interest in, in the reports. Um, I'm aware that some um, can be quite technical um, and legalistic, which um, may limit some of the interest uh, that we um, sometimes get. But I would say that um, in terms of, for example, our last report into um, FAIs, we did interview uh, 21 persons from 21 different organisations, in addition to COPFS staff, def defence solicitors, Shrevel, um, people from the Shrevel bench. So I think maybe in certain um, fields we're more... Um, people are more familiar with our work than, than others. Um, and it, there's some surprising um, uh, submissions because we have done a lot of work with um, individual defence, um, speaking solicitors in different areas, etc. So maybe the bar associations haven't got a wide appreciation of what we do, but we do try and engage with as many people in the criminal justice system as possible. However, taking account of um, the submissions made, we have um, looked at how we can raise our profile. We have now engaged with social media. And we'll put out our reports in future on social media, and I will look actively at how I can um, raise the profile of the inspectorate in relation to um, using that mechanism. Um, if I can say um, that, yes, in terms of our current programme, I think you asked, sorry, um, we are currently um, working on our follow-up report to the management of time limits. When I took, over, when I took up my post, I introduced a rolling programme of follow-up reports, which is identified as good practice for inspectorates. So we, we have continued that programme. Um, we will then, looking at our complaints handling and feedback um, report, um, embark on a follow-up report of that um, early next year. And as part of that, we're going to look at the right of review for victims that was introduced in July 2015. Um, feel, feel it fits 
quite well in with the, the complaints feedback and handling report um, to look at that right and to ensure that it has been properly implemented and that victims are actually getting the right that legislation um, provided. So we're going to incorporate that as a new part of the review. Um, but our main um, next substantive uh, report, um, and we have, we're scoping this at the present, is that we have identified um, the investigation and prosecution of sexual offences as a high-risk area, and that's the um, next report that we are, are going to embark on. I was just wondering then, as, uh, as a follow-up to that, and if you undertake investigations, you have recommendations to make to COPFS, uh, how, you, how, that, how you then work together with them to ensure that those recommendations are implemented and I mean what sort of obligations are COPFS under to implement whatever recommendations that, that you propose? There is no <coughs> statutory obligation but um, my experience the purpose the purpose of the inspectorate um, has a lot in common with the purpose of COPFS and that they want to improve and drive up standards. Um, in my um, time as chief inspector I've completed four substantive reports and in every single one of them all the recommendations have been accepted by COPFS and the Lord Advocate. As I say we will now we do follow-up reports the Crown Office will tend to pull an action plan together following the publication of a report and a senior civil service will have the lead. Um, during the reports I share my emerging findings, I discuss issues that we um, come across in the course of our um, inspection um, and that I feel um, it helps, under, helps um, people to understand our final conclusions. Um, so in terms of our recommendations, I've had no difficulty in Crown Office um, accepting them and accepting the purpose and the, 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 um, what we're trying to achieve with the recommendations. And it, it's probably um, not surprising given that we're both wanting to actually improve the service. And if we identify a gap or perceive a perceived risk, then I think it would be quite... Um, dangerous of, of a Lord Advocate or a Crown Agent to simply um, fly in the face of that, unless there was another um, approach that they wanted to employ to, uh, to, to um, remedy that um, mischief. Thank you. And when you talked in your previous answer about some of the, that the Lord Advocate can ask you to investigate specific areas, I'd just be interested to hear some examples of that or areas where they've called you in specifically to, to look at a specific yeah. issue. Yeah. Um, the... I've done, we're on, the, sorry, I beg your pardon. The review of sexual offences will be our fifth substan my fifth substantive report. Um, of those, the former Lord Advocate um, asked me to look at, um, first of all, that's a priority um, organ retention. That followed um, a public concern regarding the discovery of um, organs that have been retained without um, the nearest relatives being notified. And I think there were statements made to Parliament about that. And he was very anxious that um, I, I took a, an early look at that when I took up post. And that, so our first report was on organ retention. Um, not just about addressing the system that had been in place to ensure this was robust, that it couldn't to avoid this happening again. But as part of that um, inspection, it became apparent that due to medical advances, um, there was um, no need in, <coughs> the, um, in all but exceptional cases to actually retain organs and therefore highlighting that fact has actually meant that it's, it's now very rare and very exceptional for a whole organ to be retained. We, we did two audits to provide more reassurance for the Lord Advocate and of those um, audits we only found one further case where there had been temporary retention and all the procedures had been undertaken and families had been notified. So that was the first um, report. The second one again was at the request of the Lord Advocate, although um, I have to say that if the Lord Advocates identified a, um, something that's a risk, it generally does chime with generally people in COPFS and myself. And the second one was the management of time limits. And it was the management of time limits report, um, which is one of the drivers for us now turning to look at um, the sexual crimes review. I then decided I would like to do, I, I was conscious they were very process and technical reports and I decided I'd like to do a customer focus report and there hadn't been a, uh, an inspection into complaints handling and feedback, customer service, um, so I undertook that and um, following that I then uh, undertook the fatal accident report again um, in conjunction and discussion with the former Lord Advocate we had identified that 
there was no real evidence base to understand what was causing delays in, in the FEI. So there was a lot of anecdotal assumptions, but no evidence base. So we just we, we did a case review to give that to give some um, reassurance about on, on an evidential basis. And it's myself, um, in light of of the time limits and the increasing business now in the High Court, um, of which we believe 70% is now sexual crimes, that has identified that the next real area that we want to have a look at is sexual offences, and I have instigated that um, and scoping that review as at present. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, supplementaries? Um, we're hearing there of a couple of instances of the Fiscal Service asking you to look at something. I just wonder if you might care to comment, does that carry with it the risk that if that happens too often, that overwhelms your independent uh, ability to decide your work programme? While, of course, I, I properly recognise the value of the fiscal being able to ask you that. Um, what the first point I would say is that the actual findings and recommendations are solely attributable to me, so I'm independent in relation to the outcome of any report, even if it's the Lord Advocate that requested us to look at it. It's not um, uh, uncommon in inspectorates for um, the provision um, for ministers to be able to ask the inspector to look at significant areas of risk. The Attorney General in England and Wales can ask the inspector of the Crown Prosecution Service um, to look at um, the particular areas, as can the Cabinet Secretary with HMICS in Scotland can ask them to look at aspects of policing or the SPA work. So it's not uncommon, and perhaps given that the minister is accountable to Parliament, it's understandable that they, they, they have got some uh, independent body that they can seek reassurance um, or seek um, um, an independent review of a particular aspect of the operation of the CFPVS that is causing some concern, whether that's public or whether it's, it's arisen for some particular case. Um, but I agree, the balance needs to be correct, it needs to have an opportunity. I'm, we, we are a very small inspectorate, um, so we haven't got the capacity to do um, a great deal of reports, so we, we want to pick carefully the subjects <coughs> and that we decide to inspect to ensure we, we achieve the greatest value um, for the service and for, for um, Scotland. So, but I would go back to my point that if an area is causing concern for the Lord Advocate or um, key stakeholders or the Justice Board, then it usually it's something that we find that um, our views coincide with. And in all the areas that we were asked to do, I was very happy um, to, to consider those areas as I felt they, they were significant areas where we needed to have a proper review and a proper um, examination of the, of the subject. Thank you. Hey, Douglas Ross, followed by oh, Stuart. You have another substantive one later. Yeah. Thank you, uh, convener. Can I first of all begin by following on some points that Mary Evans made? Um, I have to say I'm, I'm slightly worried that you are speaking about uh, getting on social media to, to raise awareness. Uh, your office has been established for 13 years. Um, it was established in December 2003, yes. and it was established to introduce a measure of accountability which is essential for public confidence. And then you go through the evidence we've received on this committee, and I just pick out a few. Scottish Borders Rape Crisis Centre, I have no awareness of the IPS. Scottish Police Federation, the Scottish Police Federation is not aware of the IPS and cannot comment on its resources or effectiveness. Uh, one individual witness uh, to the committee, I have never heard of the Inspectorate of Prosecution. And even more worryingly for me, the Sheriff's Association, the Sheriff's Association, we do not receive information about the IPS or its practices. I'm sorry, I don't believe a Twitter handle is going to overcome no. these problems of over a decade of being in existence and not being known by the legal profession in which you operate. Well, I've been opposed for three and a half years. No, so sorry, I, I'm speaking I, about I, I appreciate, the role of IPS. I appreciate it's that. It's not you individually. No. Um, and, I, and I fully accept that. I was just... Um, making a point that we have listened to some of the feedback and that we will explore different ways to, to raise the profile. We do um, circulate reports to everybody that um, contributes and to anybody that we think has an interest in the criminal justice, um, in the criminal justice arena. Do the we Sheriff's do Association have an interest then? Well, 
undoubtedly, if, 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 if they have not on our distribution list, then that is a fault that we will look at. But I can say that we do speak to, um, um, in the last two reports, we, we had contributions from sheriffs um, across Scotland in relation to the FEI's um, report and um, in the complaints, no, sorry, in the in management time bars report. So we, we do um, uh, speak to sheriffs, we do speak to defence agents. Um, as you would expect, we speak to any stakeholder that has an interest. Now, um, as I've advised, we're, we are about to embark on looking at the sexual offences um, review, and many of the stakeholders that have already given evidence to this committee will, <coughs> you know, we, are, we will definitely be engaging with them and seeking feedback um, in relation to in relation to the um, the, the um, review that we're about to take. And I mean. Whilst some have said they don't have much um, awareness of us, we have had contact. Um, I, I, any event that I attend, I speak to Women's Aid and, um, and various other um, persons there. So I think, and the police, Police Scotland, we see in just about every one of our in inspections in some capacity. And we saw um, um, a lot of people in relation to police work in the FEIs, um, and um, we've already started speaking to key stakeholders in the police about well, we're scoping our sexual offences. So we do, we do see um, a lot of persons. That, um, it, it is. Um, disappointing that there is seems to be a, a lack of awareness and it is something that we will um, take we are taking seriously and we will look and see if we've got the right distribution list and where we might be where we might be missing a trick and we will it's not just about social media but we will ensure that um, that our reports um, get to the right people that um, can help us um, raise our awareness you've got two full-time inspectors why do you feel they have to be seconded from the COPFS they don't necessarily have to be seconded from CPFS. Um, during the, the, the inspection for the complaints handling of feedback, I recruited two associate inspectors. One had a police background and one had a health sector background. Um, clearly, in terms of that inspection, um, there was less focus on legal um, issues and there was um, less of a requirement to have a prosecutorial background. In fact, it was very much about customer focus. Um, and um, as I say, they came from a different organisation background and that provided a very helpful perspective. Um, however, having a pros um, having um, secondees from um, the prosecution service also brings direct benefits first of all um, obviously they have the legal knowledge of the prosecution service so we're looking at something like management of time limits which was technical and legalistic um, and there was a lot of legal points raised in that it, 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 it was helpful to have colleagues um, uh, in the team that actually had a prosecution background in addition the, I, the IT systems of COPS, there's um, three different IT systems in addition to the management information system. Again, having um, seconded deputies with that knowledge of how to use the systems is, um, is, 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 is very important because it allows us to interrogate the system with minimise um, the disruption to COPFS because we can go in, we can see how many cases of a particular type, we can access the files, we can download papers with, uh, with the systems becoming so much more electronic. We don't have to go and trouble um, fiscal offices to get hard copy papers in most cases, although sometimes that's necessary. So having that level of expertise and what I think the inspectorate allows them, um, that allows us to con people in is to acquire different skill sets that they don't maybe experience doing day-to-day -day prosecution work um, and, and um, take that back and hopefully enhance their own development in COPFS but also help um, enhance the work their work in COPFS when they go back so depending on the subject matter it can it can be um, it's not necessary that it needs to be um, person seconded, but I need a period of continuity for people to come in. So it is. You, you, you maybe understand be my concern that, that you started off by saying, you know, you don't have to have that mm. background or they don't have to be seconded from COPFS. Yet your whole answer then said how good it was that they are seconded from COPFS. So I'm now sat here wondering, well, when their period is finished, are they just going to be replaced by other people from COPFS? And you've spoken about the benefits. What are the risks? They are um, investigating and scrutinising uh, a body which they will return to work in. And surely that can be seen as a risk. Well, as I've 
um, pointed out the, the, the findings and recommendations are solely attributed to myself and I'm independent yeah, of any sorry, person. Sorry, you're an extremely so small team. You're, you're yourself on a four days a week, you've got an assistant, mm -hmm. and then you've got three investigators, one part-time, so the only two full-time investigators are from the COPFS. So while your name may be printed at the bottom of the report, it wouldn't take a genius to work out where the findings have come from in terms of the investigations. Well, in a team that size. Yes, that's obviously in a team that size, we all have to play a critical part. Um, but at the end of the day, when I make recommendations and findings, if there's any issue to be taken with them, then it's with myself that that um, um, the. the, the that I would have the discussion with um, COPFS or the Lord Advocate. Um, if there, there is a possibility to, to recruit um, associate inspectors on, a, on maybe on a temporary basis, depending, as I've already indicated, if the subject matter um, lends itself to it. And it may be, for example, in some more specialist um, areas such as economic crime, I would have to recruit a more specialist financial um, a specialist into the into help us with an inspection like that or if it was IT maybe some kind of IT expertise so I, I since I've taken up the post I have to try to look at different models of staffing the inspectorate which is why I had recruited the two associate inspection um, but it does take a bit of time for people to come in and get up to speed and how to do with inspection work and how to do it so if, if I had kept turning over staff, it does it leads to some inefficiencies. So I'm trying to get the balance right um, that suits a small inspectorate. Um, and we've we've come up across a model of we've seconded um, the current two inspectors for a two year period. Um, and once that finishes, then depending what our future programme is, it's possible that I may look for other avenues such as maybe through the Scottish Government or um, other avenues that we would want to recruit to the uh, uh, inspectors. I'm aware HMICS does have um, a more varied background but they've got a bigger team. Um, so it's not, it, it has been the pattern of how it's happened, um, but it's not fixed in stone. And as I say, I've already tried different models and we will explore um, other possible um, models. And Can I? Sorry, beg your pardon. No, if you wanted to no? finish. No. Um, to continue the discussion you had with Mary Evans and Stuart Stevenson about the Lord Advocate's involvement, not so much in terms of directing inquiries, because I think you've covered that, but he is presented with all reports in draft form. So he... That's the submission. Is that not correct? No, he, he, um, the annual report is presented in a draft form okay. to Lord's Advocate. Right, sorry. So he gets your annual report and he sits down and reads your draft report and he doesn't like something in there and he says to you, uh, would you mind taking that out? Are you in a difficult position to change something in your draft annual report that then gets laid before Parliament because he's also, or that office is also your employer? Um, Firstly, that's never happened in the three annual reports no, but I've done. But, no. I think um, it's useful to tease that out. Yeah, no, the, the annual report is, is, tends, is, is really a factual summary of the work that's been done, and um, it, it's, pretty, um, it's, it's not particularly controversial. Maybe that's why, though. <laughs> Potentially? Well, it, it's more factual. In terms of the, the, the substantive reports we do, um, at the conclusion of that report, and as I say, we try and share emerging findings um, along with, with the, the key players when we're doing the reports, the report is given to Crown Office um, and uh, for for any comments on factual accuracy, and only factual accuracy, so that I will give them a period of time to read through the report, and they will advise me if they think there's any issues of factual accuracy, and then if there are, then I would, I would but obviously... Can you understand why there would be a, a potential perception or a misconception that there is um, not enough of a division between your office and the Lord Advocate's office. He appoints you, he agrees mm -hmm. to reappoint you, he agrees your terms, uh, and finally, you present a draft report to him for him to then present to ministers, to members of parliament, uh, and he's allowed to comment upon that, and it may never have happened before. But the fact that you said it was a, a fairly generic, factually based document would suggest that it could go into to greater detail, greater depth, if maybe there was a further division between your office and the Lord Advocate's office? Well, I think the more substantive reports where we've done an inspection um, are the ones that obviously have the criticisms of COPs and the ones where we've identified risks and the ones we've identified where there is a need for a service improvement. So the annual report that comes to MSPs, to ministers, 
contains no criticisms of the Crown Office and Procurator it, Fiscal Service. It contains, uh, a, 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 it contains a, a summary and a link to the reports which actually do um, have a more um, heart-hitting purpose in, in the sense of they're, they're actually the reports that actually hopefully will make a difference. The, the annual report is a summary of the reports we've done. It's to inform um, a the public and, and MSPs of the reports, but it contains links to the reports and the work we've done in the year, which I think is the important um, part of the reports. It also um, allows me an opportunity to explain what direction the inspector is going in, um, and it, it provides factual um, information about the role of the inspectorate. Um, again, I, would, I can only speak from my experience, and in terms of any suggestion of influencing or making any changes to any of my recommendations or findings, it, it's never yeah. happened. And, and I would say, you know, my questions are not to the, the current office no. holders or anything, but no. it is just saying, and it's not just me asking this question, it was put in this, one of the submissions to this inquiry from sure. the Law Society of Scotland Indeed. raised a, a similar concern. <laughs> if no, I can ask a, a final question on, on one of the examples you gave uh, on page 5, um, paragraph seven, uh, 18 and 19 um, of your yes. uh, submission. And I've got to say, it was quite disappointing, and I was wondering, first of all, how long this process took, but you're looking at an issue that politicians have raised, uh, people within communities have raised about mental health in prisoners, and you thought, this would be a good idea, let's look into this with HMICS, and then at the end of all that, you decided there were so many difficulties in identifying a cohort of prisoners, um, and I find that disappointing that that's been kind of pushed aside now, or there's certainly significant yeah. delays, that's what you're saying. Um, and I just wonder how long that process took and really why should these difficulties be faced by you as someone and an office trying to improve uh, the court system, the justice system? Um, uh, it's, it was quite troubling to read that. Okay. Um, I, the, the scoping period that we worked with HMICS, I think, was probably about probably two, two, months, yeah, two, three two to three months. Um, we met with substantial numbers of, or, of organisations and... We looked at this because we were aware that this was a priority for um, many people in, in the Parliament and um, it was raised by the Justice Board um, with, with ourselves um, and HMICS to see if we could um, undertake some kind of inspection. And we, in particular, I, I, I was really keen to actually be able to proceed and undertake an inspection in this area. Um, for, for obvious reasons and for um, a number of reasons. However, and we, and we obviously wanted to do it for the police because it, it, is, it is a criminal justice issue, mm -hmm. this. Um, it's not just about the prosecution service and what, what, the author, just what um, alternatives they can offer. It was about what happens before you even come into the system and what options are available to the police. And we discovered there is um, a myriad of different um, I, I, I pilots, I, I, I innovations, um, and in terms of the fiscals, we did a, a, a short but um, re, um, relatively comprehensive study into diversion schemes that were available, and we looked at the possible diversion. And what we found in terms of that, and sorry, I'm slightly going off subject here, was that there wasn't a level playing field and there was a need for a more consistent approach to having, um, skill, um, having diversion schemes available throughout Scotland rather than it was, it was patchy, um, um, rather than coherent. But the real difficulty came is, and this is really because in Scotland the criminal justice system is, tends to be crime-centric, the information provided in police reports is about the type of crime. So we can identify knife crime, we can identify a, a, a domestic abuse crime, but there is less information about the offender. It's not offender-centric. So when we started, um, and, and I can provide the committee actually, we, we did, what we did in the end of the process was we produced a strategic paper to help inform the Justice Board of the gaps and the issues that we had identified, and we quite happily we'll go back and look at this if, if, if these gaps um, can be um, rectified so that we can actually identify a, co a, a, a cohort that we can actually see what, what works, what doesn't work, where I, the advantages are. I think are. just, just br briefly, what I'd like to know is, you say at the end of paragraph uh, 19 that you will revisit this as part of the IPS future work programme, which would suggest you've overcome some of the problems. Were the problems because you tried to do the work alongside HMICS or why was it that you weren't able to do that joint um, 
investigation which you started off wanting to do? And will your ultimate investigation be poorer for the fact that you couldn't go away in your original um, process that you wanted to do? The gaps were not within our gift. Um, the work has been progressed. The work that we identified has now been progressed by Police Scotland. Um, we are... Um, where they, they are now working um, with um, other persons in Scottish Government and the Justice Board to take forward some of the areas that we identified in our strategic plan. Um, that, if, if, if the information is simply it, um, not recorded in a systematic fashion about issue, people who have mental health issues, and the databases that presently exist in Police Scotland were not sophisticated enough to allow us to actually identify persons. It's, a, it's an issue that I know the Justice Board have been talking about, and um, they are trying to look at more offender-centric um, um, methods of recording crime, and that was what we flagged up. And we were. Um, very disappointed that we couldn't. We tried, um, I've got paper that I can let you see all the different options we tried to find something that would give us that, um, a, to give us a robust um, sample. Um, now, we have promised and we have said that this is something and that um, in all of the Criminal Justice Board um, are keen for us to go back and do this with or without HMSCS, but obviously it makes more sense to do it. Um, once those problems have been overcome, we'll look at it. So I, I can provide the committee with some background information on, on the different areas we looked at, and we were just um, not able to get uh, enough information, data, that would allow us to, to do something that would add value. And at the end of the day, we want to make findings that actually um, are real, realisable and um, actually evidence-based. And that was my problem. I, I, there wasn't enough to allow us to have it evidence-based. Thank okay, thank you. I think, Liam, do you have a, a supplementary you indicated before, Stuart, or was it a, a substantial? It was a supplementary on, yeah. on, on this. I mean, I have another question as well, which I'm happy okay. to come back I'll to. I'll bring you on this sup um, supplementary, Stuart, I, and then... To I just wanted uh, briefly to, to, to nail down the issue of where you draw your staff from. And I, I just <laughs> draw on some personal experience in a phrase that was written in my annual appraisal in 1971 which said, Mr. Stevenson is excellent at solving problems, especially when he creates them. And I just wonder if that is exactly <laughs> capturing why it's right that we have people from the fiscal service as part of the inspectorate, because they will best understand where the bodies lie. That there is certainly an element um, of truth in that. You need to know the questions sometimes to ask. If you don't know something, then obviously it makes it difficult to have a really in-depth um, e examination. Um, I, think, I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, and the answers were a little more brief. That would be good without curtailing yeah. anything. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, happy with that, Liam? into commenting on, on Stuart Stevens past employment appraisals, but, but just keep into... I'm sure there is, Stuart. I think that under the 2007 Act, um, the inspector is appointed by the Lord Advocate. We've already um, touched on uh, the extent to which the Lord Advocate can, um, can in, uh, invite the uh, inspector to look at particular issues. Um, we've discussed the extent to which the, there is that very close relationship with COPFS um, and uh, in terms of where you derive your, your, your staffing from and also a lack of awareness. I mean, does this not simply reinforce the point made by the Law Society of Scotland that what we need is more individuals involved in the inspectorate who aren't uh, PFs or uh, employees of, of COPs? Um, that, that there are clearly issues in COPs at the moment, and we'll come on to the substantive issues in, in, a, in a moment. But at the moment, whether it's the, those representing sheriffs, whether it's the Law Society of Scotland, whether it's uh, victims groups, none are seeing the expectorate as the route through which addressing those issues is best secured. I should probably have mentioned that the um, position of Chief Inspector is um, openly, is, is advertised nationally and is open to um, anybody that's got the relevant qualifications and skills. It don't, you don't have to be a prosecutor to apply to be the chief inspector. And it's an open, trans, 
transparent um, process involving assessment centre and interview panel. And following all of that process, the recommendation um, is then made to the Lord Advocate. Um, so, um, and but, but in that process now, I mean, given what we've heard about the issues in relation to transparency and some of the concerns around independence, and, and I, I, I take the point about those who will know where the bodies are buried um, are those with the d direct experience, but we've heard um, quite a lot of evidence over recent weeks about others who have a, an understanding of how COPs work, have very clear views about how it could be made to work better, uh, but wouldn't necessarily suffer from the same uh, perception or misconception uh, that they they uh, they have a dog in the race that they that they, they owe some allegiance, uh, whatever to, to, to cops that would would help in addressing this point about independence, but also may raise the awareness of what the inspectorate does amongst the wider stakeholders that we've been hearing from on a weekly basis in relation to the inquiry that we're doing. Well, as I said, it is open to. Um, anybody from um, to apply and um, if they, they meet the, the relevant qualifications and I went through a process and, and was appointed um, but I'm sure there was other people in that process that didn't maybe come from a prosecutorial background but um, so that's a, a matter it's undertaken by the Scottish Government and then um, as I say a recommendation um, is made um, in terms of um, Obviously, I've alluded to some of the, ba the benefits of being a prosecutor because you do know the right questions to ask, you do know um, the issues that um, are, are causing difficulty, and you do have an understanding of um, when somebody says the, the high court business is 70%, what actually that feels like in real terms and, and how it, it can be managed. But yes, um, we will, um, in terms of, and I take the point about the awareness of, of the inspectorate, um, Again, I would say we are quite a small compact inspectorate and um, we don't produce as many reports as, as some of the other inspectorates because of that. But we will engage, we do engage with stakeholders in relative to the subject matter and, as a result, and, and the sexual offences is probably one of the biggest reviews we're going to do for some time and there is um, obviously a number of people who have contributed to this inquiry that we will be engaging with and we are very aware of some of the issues that have been raised in this inquiry from our other reports. So we have the benefit of taking, for example, the issues that arose through the complaints handling about a lack of customer focus, which has um, been mentioned in terms of the submissions. The, the, in terms of victim representation, in terms of um, disclosure of sensitive personal records, that will be a feature of um, an aspect we will look at. And again, we will liaise with various um, stakeholders that gave evidence to the committee on that. So um, maybe because this is a, a, a wider ranging um, subject and it has a lot of um, a different facets to it that we are going to be looking at, then that will hopefully go some way to um, heighten our awareness. Um, but I think it's about um, having the experience sometimes and, the, and the, um, the knowledge that can actually get under the surface of some of these. But I'm not but saying it, it can be done by It's an experience and a knowledge of, of how it works. And I understand there's a value to that, but it doesn't necessarily give confidence. There's a challenge function there about how things can be made um, to work better or, or an, a, an entirely different approach adopted to deliver the objectives. And I think that's the concern, mm -hmm. that in a sense, you understand how, thing, how the mechanics ought to operate because of your intimate experience of it, but you don't necessarily have an investment in making it work differently and better. Well, there's no reason why, as well as um, Ms. McLeod answering, yeah. um, Ms. Lewington can also, um, if you want to prefer your view as the assistant inspector. Well, if I could just briefly go back to the um, organ retention uh, report. At the time that we, we, we were looking at that um, uh, issue, and obviously there was significant public concern about it, the, the um, overwhelming um, discussions with people was to have almost an overly bureaucratic system put in place because <laughs> people were nervous about it and they felt that that was the best way. Um, by the fact that we went out and we were, had an objective um, overview of, the, of what had happened and we spoke to pathologists and realised that, um, that actually there was no need to take organs but this hadn't been necessarily highlighted within the fiscal service and with the appropriate bodies. So we actually turned that all on its head and our system, um, the system that was advocated in the report, was because it's now exceptional, we will streamline that system and 
we will have the system, um, the, um, a reconciliation, mandatory reconciliation between the service providers and COPFS that actually addresses um, that um, particular problem. And we, we, we will not throw paper and bureaucracy. We will look at the simplest way possible to do it. Um, and I think that um, it did, you know, my prosecution background didn't really uh, um, apply in, in coming up with that decision and I think was best way forward in terms of the report. And the report was accepted uh, in its entirety, despite it being not what was anticipated or envisaged in the first instance. And of another example, perhaps, is a, sorry, yes, because I'm conscious of time. Is, is the short answer to what Liam is saying that you, you will look at maybe widening the membership beyond the prosecution sector, and it certainly seems to us that some of the best evidence we've had is from de defence listers, so I think that's encouraging. I'm very conscious that um, you haven't said anything yet, Ms Livington. Would you like to add something? Well, I mean, I'm relatively new to the inspectorate. I've only been in post for about six months, right. um, and that's against the background of being a fiscal or a deputy for some 22 years. But I can say just from my own personal experience, if it um, assists the committee at all, that you do feel quite a difference when you do move into that different role. It does give you that step back and that objectivity. It naturally comes, I have to say, um, although the inspector would have maybe some of the same goals as COPFS, we all want to improve that service for the public. And obviously for staff as well, some of those the issues that have risen are in relation to staff issues. Um, there are different functions there and there is a separation there and that separation is certainly clear to me um, in my experience so far. Thank you. Liam? Thank you. And Ben, then followed by Rona. The, the points that I looked to raise, convener, were covered in the answer to Douglas Ross around paragraphs 18 and 19 and I would also be interested to see the background documentation around that, so look forward to reading that. Thank you. Yeah, Rona? Yes, I would like to know um, if you, if any concerns have been raised um, with you, Chief Inspector, regarding the way domestic abuse cases are handled by uh, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, and do you agree that um, there appears to be a, that there is a, a culture of zero tolerance, and that there is some pressure um, to prosecute in these cases, perhaps you know, with maybe a lack of evidence. Um, <coughs> Domestic uh, abuse is an area that we have considered uh, as a possible uh, area for inspection. However, we are aware that currently it is being monitored by a number of different parties and um, the Auditor General spoke about Audit Scotland's role in looking at the performance um, in terms of value for money in cases proceeding through court. Um, in policy terms, I, I, I didn't hear all of the Lord Advocate's evidence this morning, but um, I'm aware that um, the, the, Lord Advocate, the Lord Advocate is... Um, has a, has a robust policy in relation to domestic abuse and if there's sufficient evidence there's a presumption of proceedings and it's not for me to stray into policy areas all I would say in that regard is that prosecution um, policy is a legitimate tool to try and change behaviours and we've seen that work in the past with knife crime drink driving and um, hate crime um, given that the policy um, and, and given that the um, recent statistics as um, given evidence to this committee by ACC Higgins is that 80% of the cases that they report to the fiscal um, result in a conviction, which would suggest that there's, the decision making is pretty spot on um, in terms of that high percentage. Given the number of people um, monitoring this area, we felt there was probably less value that we could add at this stage to look at domestic abuse than perhaps looking at the investigation prosecution of sexual offences where there's a, a number more um, issues that we'd like to explore. So it is something we've had on our radar. We are conscious of all the discussion and we have been um, listening to the submissions to the committee. Um, finally, I would just say that I um, there is, you know, I, I, I don't know if the Lord Advocate mentioned it today, but there is a prosecution code um, <coughs> that prosecutors work to and nobody should be taking cases, there should be no um, cases taken without sufficient evidence and I think that was borne out in some of the evidence uh, that the Lord Advocate gave and the Lord Advocate has, has um, indicated that he uh, is keen to place trust and faith Thank in prosecutors. You. Thanks. Uh, are you happy with the independent review panel's uh, position on all of this? Um, the independent review panels um, is, is something that is relatively new to COPFS and um, 
Um, as part of having our discussions with um, Crown Office, um, we, we looked to see where they're adding value and continuous improvement, and we were quite impressed at the, the concept of the review panel in terms of improving open sea and transparency of decision making. Um, I personally haven't sat in a review panel and I haven't seen the paperwork of it, but it is something that we'll probably look at seeing um, um, the benefit of when we go to look at our sexual offences review and maybe have um, more of an opportunity to see how it actually works in practice. Okay, thank you. Mary? Thank you, Convener. My question follows on um, quite nicely from my, my colleague's question. Your, your paper points out the, the review that you're, you've recently embarked on in the investigation and prosecution of sexual crimes. Yes. Um, and, and there is more and more use of, of specialist, um, specialist areas within the, the, the Crown Office um, service. And I've got two small questions to ask you. And one is, do you intend looking at any of the other specialisms? And do you have any concerns that the increasing use of, of specialist um, courts and, and specialist services dilutes from the core function of the Crown Office? Um, in, there have been um, specialists in sexual offences probably um, a, since the setting up of the National Sexual Crimes Unit in, I think, 2009. Um, <coughs> so it was one of the first areas um, to, um, a, to, to attract a, a specialist cri um, criteria and all the deputies that require to um, be involved in sexual offences have required accreditation, special training, etc. Um, as part of our review, um, the committee will be aware that the Crown Office has recently restructured um, yet again, and um, the we're looking precise, um, so we're looking at the High Court um, sexual offences. So we're going to incorporate as part of that review review a look at how the functional hubs are working under the new structure so we'll look at the bit of governance arrangements that have come in with the new structure and the new um, a, the new teams that are going to take forward dealing with these offences um, so we will look at a bit wider the, at the specialist role and what they're uh, how they're adding value to the cases um, at each stage um, of the proceedings um, I, I think I caught the end of the, the evidence from um, the Crown Agent and the Lord Advocate and clearly um, a, in, in certain particular cases having a specialist um, is, 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 who understands the dynamics of the different aspects of domestic abuse, sexual offending is extremely important and it has been um, the NSEU is, a, is actually an area that we'll have a look at as part of the review to see again um, how they fit into the wider scheme of, of looking at the specialisms. Um, in terms of uh, the, the general um, fiscal service, um, I have no input into the budget allocation or the prioritisation by COPS. Um, all I can do is, when I look at a particular area, identify where I see a training need or identify where there's a staffing need or identify where there's some other um, measure that needs to be put in place. For example, in the FEIs, we, we, we came across frustration on behalf of many nearest relatives that there was no continuity of a single person taking them through from that mm. beginning and the end process and we made that recommendation which has been accepted but we acknowledge that has resourcing implications for COPS so we <coughs> make comments on um, individual areas about resourcing. I, I have no input into the actual prioritisation of overall budgetary control that's just more for Audit Scotland to look mm. at the financial sustainability. What's the time scale for the review that, that you've just recently started? Well, as I say, we are presently um, just about to conclude the scoping of that, which will allow us to um, a <coughs> to plan the timescales. Um, I think um, we probably need... A, we were at the moment looking at what sample size we would maybe want to do a case review. Once we've decided that, that will inform how long it will take. But I can certainly provide information on timescales uh, to the committee uh, once Thank we you. come to that conclusion. <laughs> I wonder uh, if, Chief Inspector, you could offer a view as to why senior managers had become invisible. I'm referring to your um, annual report. Um, yes, um, the annual report um, highlighted some concerns that had come out of the consultation exercise that <coughs> occurred in the shaping the future programme that was um, initiated by COPS. Um, and I think I highlighted some of the concerns that um, uh, were flagged up by staff in COPFS, one of them being lack of visibility by managers, and the other one was um, about resilience because of the ring fencing of sheriff and jury business, and summary meant there was less flexibility um, and resilience when there was particular staff shortages for a particular mm. reason. Um, 
that they, those were consequences of the move to the federation structure, which was um, started in 2012. Um, I think they, they were acknowledged at the end of that consultation exercise by um, senior management at COPFS um, as resulting um, from really unattended consequences of the, the federation process. And are, they're looking um, in the new model, obviously we've moved, the Crown Office have moved to a functional um, model uh, to deal with core work. And as part of that, we've, they've reintroduced local court, which now combines again sheriff and jury and summary business. So hopefully it's still very early days and it's still to bed in. And um, it is something that obviously we do keep a watching brief in all of these areas of COPFS, but hopefully this will now allow for more resilience um, back in this, the sheriff courts. And in terms of the visibility of, man of, um, of fiscals, there's now because they're aligned with the local sheriffdoms, the six sheriffdoms, there's a procreative fiscal for each sheriffdom. It's kind of reinforced, um, re reinstituted the link between courts, the police, and the local fiscal that um, perhaps for the summary level had been spread too thin because the federation structure was um, really big, large structures, east, north, west, etc. So I think they've, they've taken on board the criticism and the, the the comments and the feedback and the, hopefully this new structure is seen as a, a way of addressing that and I, I heard the Crown Agent allude to fair futures and some of the other issues that came out of that consultation such as well-being issues that really impact on staff, quality of life etc, um, they, they are going to be taken forward under the fair futures programme um, and that's something again that we are very um, keen to keep an eye on and I've had discussions with the director of HR as to what work streams are involved in that and we will be look at in due course how that was um, developed and what outcomes were identified and how they were implemented so there may be scope for us to do something in due course and we, we're definitely watching how that progresses yeah. in due course. I, I suppose a question that's something asked the Auditor General as well given all that's come out of this inquiry and there has been a lot um, has it changed how you would maybe approach your inspections them. It's been very much on a thematic approach or maybe not in your tenure, certainly before, um, as opposed to a holistic approach. Uh, is there anything that you know you would change in how you've approached the well, uh, inspections? I think one of the issues since I took up post is um, it's been a as I say in my annual reports, it's never stopped changing. Um, the structures have changed from 2012 mm -hmm. and then they've moved on. Um, so it's been hard to sometimes just um, to, 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 to make a recommendation with things that keep moving forward. But I would say, it's, and I alluded to it, that in terms of the sexual offences, um, now that we have got the functional um, teams in place, this will give us an opportunity to look at more about the structure around that as well as actually the, the thematic of sexual offences. So we will hopefully look at... Um, you know, the new structure regime that's been put in place as well as the, the thematic um, subject matter of sexual offences. But um, can, can I ask you what you think the biggest challenge is for the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service? <coughs> well, I, um, given one of the factors that we've decided to look at sexual offences was because we identified that with increasing volume of serious crime, so now 70% sexual, um, global crime transcending national boundaries, all becoming much more complex <coughs> in terms of the management of um, high court cases. We, we said in the Management of Time Limits report that there was a risk of these cases being lost because of budget, uh, in, term, in times of budgetary constraint. Um, <coughs> that pre-petition work has continued to increase and it's now it was 50% when we were looking at it in the Management of Time li Limits as the average of the high court, it's now 70. So we have picked this area because we think this is a significant risk area. Um, we think it's high profile and we think, we hope, that we can identify areas where we can um, so make improvements. So we are analysing and looking behind that, which yeah. I think that sounds like an excellent way forward, and hopefully when you complete that work, everyone will know. I hope so. <laughs> who the <laughs> Inspector of Prosecution is. That completes our questioning. Just before we um, can I ask Ms Lungton, will you be returning to the, the service once you've completed your secondment? It is, a, it is just a two-year secondment, so yes, yeah. uh, uh, that's my okay. plan. Okay, thank you both very much for appearing before us today. Um, can we just move on rather than suspend? I don't want any more suspensions. If we could suspend briefly just to let the uh, witnesses go, but I don't want you to move anywhere because we'll move swiftly on.
Agenda item four is subordinate legislation and consideration of negative SSI, line court and office fees variation devolved functions order 2016 SSI 2016 oblique 390. I refer members to paper five. Do members have any comments? John Finney. Hey, thank you, Convener. I, I think many people find it strange that we're still talking about these sort of things and an individual can't just have a coat of arms if they want. But what I wanted to comment on was paragraph nine of the paper, which used a term which I don't know that I understand and I don't know that it's helpful, and that is the term a joint informal consultation took place. Um, I think we want formality if we're dealing with legislation that has um, expenditure <coughs> implications. I'll ask the clerk their advice on this because Peter has seen it before. Okay. Sorry, I have little to add to what the member said, just to say that um, I have seen that wording used before in these types of um, uh, consultations on, on instruments. But Do you want to make a recommendation that it shouldn't be used or that there's other words? Well, it just seems entirely out of kilter with the, 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 a subsequent paragraph that then lists a group of people who have been consulted and a, and a number of representatives. So, I, I don't know how informal it is. Is this someone picking up a phone? Presumably there's a list somewhere. Let's just keep things formal of its legislation. Okay. That's all. all right. Noted. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Just on that point, uh, just for information, I note that the income the Lord Lion Court receives uh, from its efforts amount to 60000 a year. In other words, we're not talking a very large amount of money, and I do happen to know that the application for a coat of arms is of the order of £3,000. So we're probably talking about a very small number of people. Maybe, I, I don't express the view that's certainty. Maybe that's why an informal, I John only suggest. Yeah, for the avoidance of doubt, my comment about that is, is about the fact that we have a piece of legislation here and that term's been used. It's not what the actual yeah. bit of legislation is. I, I think we should have formality about legislation in this. Okay. That's noted, but uh, are you content not to make any recommendations? It's All agreed? Thank you for that. Agenda item five, Justice Subcommittee on Policing. Um, this is to consider a report back from the last meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on 15th of December when it discussed a draft letter to the Cabinet Secretary on financial planning for 2017-18 in relation to the police budget. I will invite Mary Fee, the Subcommittee Feeder, uh, Convener, to report back. Before I do, can I advise members that following the verbal report there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions if there are any specific areas of work members wish the Justice Committee to consider in more detail. This can be discussed under the programme item which is um, at this meeting or at a future meeting. I refer members to paper six and Mary would you give your verbal report please. Thank you, um, Convener. The Justice Subcommittee on Policing met on the 15th of December 2016 and agreed the content of our letter to the Justice Committee on Police Scotland and the SPA's financial planning for 2017-18. A copy has been included in today's meeting papers. And as you can see from the letter, we reached conclusions in relation to the following issues. The forecast overspend of 17.5 million for 2016-17, communicating effectively with staff about financial plans, achieving efficiency savings, tackling new and emerging crimes, undertaking non-criminal work such as assisting those with health issues and VAT liability. I hope the letter speaks for itself, but I am happy to address any questions or comments you may have. And the committee has previously agreed that the letter would be included as an annex to its report to the Finance Committee about the 2017-18 draft budget. Thank you. Members, have any questions? Um, I, I thought this was very useful um, uh, after the discussion we had last week about having more information, and it, it's a very good summary. My question is just convener, uh, whichever convener. Uh, we have a, a minute of the meeting uh, added to our desk today, which includes a reference to a vote that took place. 
Can I ask, uh, for those of us not at the subcommittee, was the division, um, Margaret Mitchell, asking for an amendment to be included and six members wanting that amendment not to be included, did the members vote against it because that wasn't said? Or why did they vote against it? That was a, the meeting last week was held in private. So anything that happened in private, the, the, the note is... Is, is this um, private? Uh, no, that's, that's tab tabled and it will be on that's the website tabled, yeah. and it's an explanation of what came out of that meeting. But any discussions that took place were in private, so mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't be anything that would be legitimate questioning for, for mm -hmm. Mary at this point. What can we do with this minute then? Well, we, the, the minute is a matter of record and, <laughs> and that stands. Um, what we're looking at now is, is there any issues, and I, I, I suspect there will be from the, the letter and the areas that the, the committee looked in the subcommittee, which we might indicate that we want to include um, at, uh, for discussion later um, in our work programme. Uh, Stuart Stevenson and then Douglas. I was just going to make the general point that I think uh, absolutely it should feed into the work programme okay. uh, of, the, of the main committee and indeed the main committee should perhaps give consideration as to whether it wishes to draw the subcommittee's attention to matters it would wish the subcommittee to address because it is a subcommittee of the main committee. Mm -hmm, yeah. I remind members we formed this so that the whole Justice Committee could be informed and have a view on policing issues which are very yeah, important. And, and the, Mary, the, sorry. The, the subcommittee is meeting on the 12th of January and that's when we're looking at our work programme. So <coughs> it, it, you know, if any members have any issues I think we should be looking at in relation to the work we're going to do, I'd be happy to, to be told about that. Okay, Douglas. Well, yeah. I think one of the issues I wanted uh, us as a committee, but if you're not setting your work programme until uh, the 12th of January, do we have to wait to see what you're looking further into? Because I, I think the I6 issue, there's still some dubiety in this report. You know, it's the Cabinet Secretary said that the savings of uh, I6 and IT weren't included mm -hmm. in the, the large savings police Scotland have mm -hmm. to make, yet the Association of Superintendents said there, there was um, issues there. And I wonder... Can we look at that as a, a full justice committee or is that something you plan to look at? As Anything a that's <coughs> in the letter we can consider under our work programme. Well, well that would be something I think we should, should look at because uh, it seemed from this letter from the subcommittee that there were differing opinions as to the savings, uh, where the savings are allocated in terms of any IT savings and how, many, how much has been saved or spent in public money, etc. Okay, that's mm -hmm. noted. Um, are we content with that approach to um, John Finney? Yeah, no, I, um, I, I don't know that there is the uncertainty that uh, Douglas suggests about that issue. But um, I think it's very important that it is seen as being inclusive and that mm. there, there, there are no, if, you, if, if we would have it, um, uh, no members of this committee would feel in any way disenfranchised. But equally, we need to avoid duplication. Absolutely. is what we need to, to avoid. Mm -hmm. But if, if we're making mm -hmm. bids, and just since that will be on the record, whereas the work programme <laughs> will not criminal. be on the, 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 unfortunately not be on, on the record, then with almost daily uh, revelations about the impact of um, surveillance and undercover policing, <coughs> further ones yesterday, I would be very concerned if there wasn't attention paid to that by whichever committee, either the substantive committee or the subcommittee. There's widespread public concern about this right. and the frustration that's gone into people who are legitimately pursuing issues of being dece deceived. Um, yeah. Duly noted. Any other questions? If not, then we shall move into private session. Before I do so, wish everyone formally a Merry Christmas and a relaxing festive period. I suspend the meeting now to allow um, the public and the official report to leave the room.